Blog Talk Radio. Mindset to my uh, mind and everything, which is great and everything like that. And I think uh, work 
we're we're uh, boring down. We're drilling down on uh, getting closer to the heart of the matter. Uh, the, the, the true enemies of America. That's true. And uh, uh, basically, by pinpointing them and not getting distracted, and, and, and that's the key. They, if you get, like like you said, it, it's not just a Zionist, but it's a, a, co- a cooperative group. And uh, and so what I've been trying to do is assemble all the components so it begins to make sense, all the pieces of the puzzle. Like, I've got a couple of videos up there by uh, Chip Tatum. He was a former uh, uh, operational subgroup uh, CIA agent slash officer, because there's two different types, agents and officers. Uh, and uh, he's done it all. He uh, explains in his video uh, about all the different uh, – so this has been going on for a while. This has been a building up. They've been putting the par- uh, pieces together. They've been making actions and stuff like that. Our CIA works with Mossad and uh, – you know, so The example I give right in the beginning of the film is the Iran-Contra affair because that is something that – you know, it's not a debate or anything. It's been admitted they were caught or you know, they were prosecuted, although a large group of them got immunity thanks to Lee Hamilton, who's the same schmuck that was on the 9-11 commission. But they're completely busted, and this is an event where compartments within the whole security system, not only in the CIA but in the NSA, as well working with the Israelis – working with elements in Iran and working with elements in Nicaragua and Honduras, you have these multitude of intelligence agencies from different countries, billions of dollars going back and forth. They're illegally trading arms. They're illegally trading guns. They've got this October surprise deal with the guys in Iran, um, worked out with Reagan, although he pretends to have you know know nothing about it. But George Bush's office and the continuity of government are running this whole operation for years, at least since 1979 until 1986, when they finally got busted because Nicaraguans shot down a plane flown by a CIA agent filled with uh, contraband. And they're there killing the Santanistas. you got all these thousands of people dying, and it happened completely in the dark, and it happened completely in the dark not only for the American public, but from most of the U.S. government, didn't even know what another portion of the government was doing on its own with its own money that it made off the books from the illegal drug trades and the illegal arm trades. So there's a shadow government and there's a shadow economy. Yeah, Chip Tatum goes into that. He he says that he was working with Oliver North. He claims Oliver North set up the Coke kitchens. He said he saw him there. He was flying in the helicopter with Oliver North. He was actually the pilot. And uh, uh, Oliver North was in the was one of the main uh, – he set up the Coke kitchens. So what they were doing was is they were, uh, you know, making cocaine. Uh, members of the U.S. military and CIA and uh, the TWIG, uh, the terrorist uh, watch, gr- uh, watch group, I think it is, it was set up under the uh, Ronald Reagan administration at the behest of uh, the Vice President Bush – the time, and that's uh, that's where it got started. Twig, it's uh, an acronym, and it came off that. Uh, all the different subgroups that we have today have come off of that. But uh, well, Kit- well, Kissinger and them were selling uh, heroin out of the out of Laos during the Vietnam War. I mean, they well, always go back used to that. You, yeah, the drug right, Air America. That goes back to yeah. that too. But the, with some the of these same flight schools in Iran Contra were involved in 9/11 again. Some of these the Rinky Dink Britannia and stuff. They run with the Christian evangelists. Um, getting diamonds out of Africa as well as drugs into Central America. He goes into that too. He he mentions how all right, Oliver North, according to his account of things, personal account of things, is that Oliver North was setting up the Coke kitchens. Okay, the, and uh, what happened was is that they were uh, taking the Coke uh, out of Nicaragua and Honduras and everything like that and bringing it into Arkansas – and handing it off to uh, people representing Bill Clinton when he was governor there. So that's why all these people are working together when they're they're hanged together. Bush, Clinton, these two uh, opposite ends of the political spectrum in theory, but that's more just Hegelian dialectic. These guys are are, are according to Chip Tatum's account of things. He was there. He wrote notes on it and stuff like that. He produces in his video and stuff like that that shows like on the back of his. Uh, uh, flight schedules and stuff like that. He's required to document who was in the uh, the chopper, and then he submits them to the station. And 
uh, it's all documented over a period of time, uh, that, uh, you know, our government, our employees were doing, like you said, they were, they were uh, manufacturing the cocaine, shipping it back into the country, and mm-hmm. it was Bush working with Clinton, and that's how they get their huge black budgets. Another one he goes into, another story he goes into, is where uh, working with the Shah of Iran and the Medellin cartel, they uh, – it's very complicated, but basically the Shah had a, a set of plates for like $100 bills, U.S. $100 bills. He had a way of uh, creating a, a counterfeit currency, depositing it. Uh, and laundering, uh, it's a complicated thing, it's hard to follow, but uh, Medellin money was, a, so they were doing business with Medellin cartel uh, and laundering it through different uh, banks and this whole thing and everything like that, but the Shah was involved in counterfeiting U.S. currency and they were like shipping pallets of money back and forth and so all these guys and everything, they're all connected, and Bush, the main thing is, Bush, uh, our first Bush president, okay, was involved as the kingpin and all of that stuff. He really is a kingpin of the New World Order. And he went up there and said a New World Order. Bush is very significant in this whole thing. Well, he was CIA director when they were preparing the cells in Afghanistan and and Pakistan, which were later used during 9-11 to finance it. He was, the, I mean, he was the head of the CIA before he was vice president. That's right. You have to remember that. And he never really left the CIA. No. And... Uh, furthermore, uh, again, back to the Hegelian dialectic, building up one side, financing one side, financing the other, throwing them together, just like in a football game, and uh, the product, you manage the, the conflict. It's more like pro wrestling. Uh, yeah, it's more like pro wrestling, right. Manage the conflict, uh, there's a victor and a, and a loser, and then there's the rebuilding, so there's this debt, uh, a boom and bust of debt, and uh, basically... It's important to remember that Prescott Bush and Union Bank, have you uh, studied that concept, that story? Yeah. So then you got Prescott Bush, Skull and Bones, Prescott Bush, BCCI. Uh, grandfather, he was Union Bank vice president. FDR closed Union Bank down, uh, and the Truman administration, they, they brought that whole Union Bank to uh, a close because they were laundering Nazi dollars. So this exposes the fact that that Adolf Hitler and his, the Nazi regime was being financed and given material support by our government and uh, the English government. So it wasn't just an accident. It arose out of the ashes, you know, on a, on a frugal grassroots campaign. No, it was financed and helped along the whole way by people like Prescott Bush. Okay, so His son, Prescott Jr., which would be George's uncle, was also um, doing dealings with it. Japanese mafia, Yakuza, and with the Inagawa Kai, which is a long story. But all these Bushes are involved. You know, Bush's other brothers involved with the Russian oligarchs, with the Ignite Software. Um, each of them, the largest crime syndicates in the world. Bush Jr., of course, is all involved with the Israelis. But with the Mossad, the CIA, the Inagawa Kai, Yakuza, the Russian oligarchs, Borzovsky and the rest of them, and then, of course, the Nazis are the largest crime syndicates in the world, and they all have ties to the Bush family. That's what they do. Do you ever get a chance to uh, talk with or communicate with Benjamin Fulford? Because he's over in your neck of the woods, right? Yeah, but I haven't gotten a chance to talk to him. Oh, man. He, I mean, uh, I mean, he talks about this stuff. He brings in the, the Rockefeller connection to the Japanese royal family, for example. Yeah, I've read several books about that. It's um, I mean that's a long issue. There's uh, I can recommend some if people are interested in what the crimes here. I mean, they've CIA has been using Japan and the Japanese under the underworld to steal precious earth metals and things and tungsten from China has been the main thing. But also they just rack in tons of money from illegal prostitution and normal mafia style things. But on a scale that is that just completely overshadows what you might think of in the American mafia, just you know trading on horses and the the yakuza and the Russian mob are far far larger than any other in the world because they have CIA support. Yeah, that's 
thing, and you're, you're talking about the hidden enemies of America, and that's what we're focusing on here, is, uh, is uh, detailing what it people, looks like. People should look up the Kadoma affair with Lockheed Martin from 76. This, I guess you could Google around about that and, and look at that scandal. That was massive. That was Japan's Watergate. What happened there? Oh, well, we had the CIA using Lockheed Martin as a medium to finance all these mobsters that were actually in the Japanese diet. And um, it ended up with uh, an individual crashing his plane into a mobster's uh, house in a suicide mission. This is one mob gang versus another. But um, they procured all these contracts for Lockheed and Boeing, all these American aerospace companies. Um, that was their reward. But at the same time, they were getting the LDP in position so that they could, you know, be the way the diet works is the way a lot of parliaments work. You know, if you have the majority party, then you get to pick the prime minister, et cetera. So that's the most important thing is getting in as many of your minions as possible for U.S. interests. And they had a lockdown for 53 years in a row. It was just we finally have a new government now. And it's not like Democrats and Republicans. They actually are a little bit different, although not great. But it's taken until... 2010, actually, before they ever broke the LDP monopoly in Japan, the Liberal Democratic Party. Why? You don't pay attention to the word liberal, but it doesn't matter. Like, It's the same stuff. They're neocons. Well, um, I saw a great uh, series of YouTube videos on uh, the Japanese uh, mafia. Uh, they actually went into the different houses and the structure of it. And everything where they have the neophytes and they have like the guys that sit at the desk and uh, they you know uh, they have a little meeting area on the sofa and everything like that and there's a lot of respect given to the you know different rankings up and then somebody when they comes he comes back from jail they have like a little ceremony of welcome him back you know and this uh, all the just the different uh, the security measures because there's a lot of infighting right and stuff like that so there's a uh, you know a lot of security measures and uh, yeah, the neophytes are all studying up on the law, so when they do get busted, they know what to do and stuff like that. So there's just like a, it was very interesting. This was probably done in the 80s or something like that. It was, a, it was not a brand new video, but uh, yeah, it's yeah. changed a lot. It seems Japan gets painted with this, I don't know, or, orientalized brush, where it's so neat the way they used to do things that I mean, people have this idea. I mean, you know, because you lived here, but people have this vision of Japan with the samurai and ninja and stuff and the honor system and all that. And, like, I mean, some of the honor systems still there. There definitely aren't any samurai or anything anymore. But um, the Yakuza doesn't work the way it did in the beginning. It had this very pyramid-style structure with the boss and everything. But now it's much more complicated. They they're do the more like the American style, good old border directrix, and you move it through, you have mobility based on merit and... It's um, very international. Hmm, interesting. Well, um, thing is, is that um, <clears throat> since I listen, I mean, uh, I've walked, I've walked into uh, uh, bookstores, whether it's in Thailand, Singapore, uh, Japan, Philippines, Thailand, all these different countries I've lived over there, and you can find a lot of reading matter that talks about Zionism. It talks about, uh, from different perspectives, you could uh, see, on uh, one hand, the rape of Nanking, if you go into, uh, you know, uh, into a Hong Kong bookstore or something like that, and you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, stuff that you can't find on the bookshelves here and stuff like that. In other words, they're very much aware of Zionism and the Jewish supremacist movement over there in uh, Southeast Asia. As a matter of fact, I was talking with this one lady at the bank in Thailand, and she was telling me about, hey, man, they couldn't wait to get the IMF. When they had their little uh, problem back in the uh, late 90s when they went, I was there for that when the, when the Thai bot went to like 50 to the dollar for a while there. Now it's coming back down to its historical levels of 25. But uh, they couldn't wait to get the IMF out of there. They, they knew they knew that what they were up to, it was very offensive to them because they have a real sense of the Asian uh, the societies over the racism is not uh, verboten like it's supposed to theoretically over here. Uh, and so, like, I know, I know that racism uh, is a big thing. It's like a pecking order. If you're in one country, you respect that uh, nationality's uh, dominance or superiority, uh, and and they and they allow uh, racist things to happen and stuff like that. Like, you can in Thailand, there'll be a sign over the door for Japanese customer only, or 
everything in English so you can read it. <laughs> and this is acceptable. There's a, there's, there's, there's a signs in the window, say, for a Thai customer only or this, that, and the other thing. So this is a living over there. Uh, I think I've seen I, that, but it tends to be – they have that, but it actually just means Japanese speakers only because I have no trouble getting in anywhere, and I don't look Asian at all. It's just uh, the reason they have that uh, in Japan anyway is because of the military brats. They just sick of them coming in and, and acting like animals. And so they just say, oh, well, this is just for Japanese um, as a way of keeping them out. Is that the people on the American bases in Japan are not the best representatives of the United States. You got a lot of 19 year old screw ups drinking and they, you know, feed off one another and they act like. I, any mil- country's military base personnel probably acts like on leave in a exotic country in their minds. So they put these signs up to prevent that. But uh, I've never had any problem in Japan when I see that. I, I have had friends uh, that say, oh, I couldn't get in there. I'm like, do you speak Japanese? And they, no. And they don't, they, that's why they don't feel like dealing with you. You know, They don't know how to talk to you and whatever they're doing, you know, that's necessary. So they're like, look, if you don't speak the language, then you don't get to participate. Well, no, in Thailand and the Philippines, they have the clubs that are specifically for Japanese customers only, for example. Like that's I try to go. <laughs> oh, it's very real, though. I mean, and there's hundreds of them it. in the city of uh, Bangkok and, uh, you know, 20 uh, in Manila that I've, uh, I've been to. So I've been to, I, I try to get in because they have a lot of cool chicks in there. It's like these uh, guest gentlemen, as we'll call them. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, and uh, I try to get in there, and the guys are at the door. They, there's the first to sign. If, if, if by chance you are able to get in there, they're all looking at you horrified, and uh, immediately uh, some guys rushing to the door to uh, point you out. <laughs> and so because you're white, and uh, this is just the way it is. Uh, and I'm saying for the Thai clubs, they have you know. And as a matter of fact, it breaks down even uh, in Thailand, where they have separate sides of town. They have the German side of town. Uh, because the German and the English are always fighting. And then they also have, uh, you know, there's, it's very broken up based on race and ethnicity because there's, that's just the way it is. And the same thing in the Philippines. And uh, so in Korea, a little bit the same way too, man. If you get a busted walking down the street with uh, a Korean woman, you're going to get your ass kicked. Almost guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Basically, you don't because you know it's going to be a fight. It's just a question of how many minutes go by and everything like that. Certain other countries are a little bit more liberal, like Thailand's okay and everything like that. Actually, it's quite different. I'd walk down the street. Like, like so some chick will be coming around with her boyfriend that I know from before. She'll say uh, to him, uh, why don't you go uh, up a ways, you know, I'll meet you in a few minutes. And then she'll come down and sit with me and we'll catch up. And then she'll run back and catch up with her boyfriend. And he'll have no problem with that. He's totally cool with that. So it's the different mentalities. <clears throat> but anyways, that's getting off the street. <laughs> but just yeah, I'd say my wife's Japanese. We've never had any problems here or in the U.S. with with uh, at least racism, not to my face anyway. Well, well, yeah, good. Good for you. I mean, that's great. I mean, it allows you to hang there. And everything I'm like a kind of intimidating-looking person, though. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, all I know is, like, I've been on a bus in Thailand, for example, on a public bus. Because I used to teach English, and so I would have to. That's how I would get to the class area, you know, the, to the school every day. And uh, at one time, I'll never forget it. Uh, it was the bus was packed, and they have like a little uh, lady come around and like get the money from you. It's not like in America where you step on the bus and pay. You sit down first, and then some lady comes by and you know, asks you where you want to go, and she gives you, a, you know, a receipt and uh, you know takes your money. And so uh, this is the, she's like the conductor or whatever. And so, like, I come in, and I was like, I was on the bus for like 20 minutes or something like that. And all of a sudden, a Buddha man comes on here, and you know, uh, he's with his orange robes and everything like that, and uh, he needs a seat. I'm the only white guy in the whole fucking bus. What does she do? She she looks at me, she points at me, snaps her fingers, and gestures me with her thumb to get up. And then everybody kind of is looking at me, you know. And I'm kind of like, uh, okay. So I got up and stood, and the Buddha man took my place. Afterwards, I thought about that. I was like, fuck. I'm not Buddhist. It's not my fucking country. Why don't one of these Buddhists get up for their Buddha man? It means something to them. You know, I'm apathetic one way or the other. Now, mm-hmm. that's an example, the subtle example that you that sometimes it'll wash in your face, you know, <laughs> when you're over there. And so there's the good and bad in everything. 
but I know what I've experienced. Someone can tell me any different, and I'm glad that you haven't really experienced that. So that's really cool, man. So they're accepting of. Uh, well, I haven't been in Thailand either, so. <laughs> yeah, certain areas a little bit raw. They're a little bit more refined. Like Tokyo is a beautiful modern city. It's incredible. It's like our cities are so shabby in comparison. I agree with that. No, just it's just a, so much. There's an interesting little vid. Uh, I put out someone else did the work on it. I got it through an email, but it's just all these pictures of Detroit now versus Hiroshima, um, and then from 50 years ago. Maybe you've seen it. <laughs> and Detroit's all dilapidated and falling apart. And it looks like a bomb hit it. Yeah, and Hiroshima isn't obviously, even though a bomb did hit it. Even it's not exactly where it used to be. That city moved over a little bit. Oh really? Well, it's all radiated where the dirt was. <clears throat> uh, right. Uh, what is it cordoned off or something, or do they have like where they can't? Do they just? No, it's, they're stuff? still. I mean, everything works there besides like growing vegetables and stuff. You can, <laughs> you're not gonna. The level isn't going to matter to a person or anything. It's just in the soil somewhat. Some things are still affected. Oh, I see. Um, well, uh, again. Uh, you know, not to, I mean, you got to be careful about talking about probably certain things, even though you're living in Japan or anything, so I won't take it on that road. But, uh, yeah, just a, just a point of reference. You know, I know what it's like to live as an expat overseas in Asia. I have a lot of experience. I have the past. Um, and uh, so uh, it's good that you're there as an ex, because, like, we have Bob Chapman comes on the show once a week. Now, he's an expat, talks about this stuff. And it's not, if you're going to talk about this stuff, it's kind of, you know, you have Max Kaiser, he's an expat talking about stuff. You have a lot of people that are expats, uh, you know, talking about the state of affairs in Western, uh, in the Western world, and it's probably a safe position to do it from, actually. Hmm. I think so. Corbert's over here, too. Um, oh. From his reports, he lives in Japan. Is that right? Mm hmm oh. James Corbett. So, there's a lot of us over here. Okay, so, Here's the thing. Um, your your movie. Uh, tell. I mean, let's, let's get some background. I'm interested. Uh, like, uh, you know, what uh, motivated you to do it, and how much uh, time did it take, and you know, all kind of little details about uh, War by Deception, uh, dismantling the hidden American enemies. Well, first, I I wrote a text document because at the time I didn't know how to make a, a video, and this was before YouTube existed, and before MySpace, and before Facebook, and all. So I thought. I don't know how I'd get anybody to see it or where I would host it if I did make it because I would thought about just you know talking to a microphone or something. So I wrote the text document and that one was titled "Iraq 9/11 PNAC All Roads Lead to Israel." Uh, you could throw the anthrax in there too. I just didn't want the title to be too long and it's had you know over a hundred thousand reads on my site alone. So it's it's gone around. Everybody's seen that. And then I decided once. Uh, there were video share sites and social networking sites that, okay, I need to make a film version of this. Once I saw Loose Change and some of the other 9-11 films that I thought were horrible, uh, you know, better than nothing. I mean, it did something, and people got excited about it. But I thought, man, they didn't say anything about anything, really. All they said is there were bombs in the building. Didn't say who put them there. Didn't say how they got there. Didn't connect it to the anthrax. Didn't understand that 9-11 was used as the uh, catalyst for perpetual war and not, the whole picture was missing so I thought I've got to make this film but uh, it took a long time it took me about five years to get it all together I had an older version of the film in 2008 I put it on YouTube I was deleted within three hours my whole account was removed not just my video my whole account yeah. so I took another two years building a new YouTube account it's my regular you know, Ron Paul videos and all that, and then put it out again, got censored on t two segments of it, and then I created a new, my wife's YouTube account, and I put it on there, and it stayed there, and so many people have copied it now, uh, but it took about five years. The other thing was, I kept getting new information, things were getting declassified, just this year, some of the civil admin stuff was finally made available, and I've been talking with her on email and so on, and so I incorporated all that in the film. And there's actually a good hour and a half worth of stuff that was cut that's on the DVD that I didn't put in uh, more specific details about profiteering and about PNAC. 
about, you know, the media, the stage Saddam statue toppling and things like that because I didn't want the film to be like five hours long. So I decided, well, I'll just put it as extras on the DVD and give somebody a reason to get the DVD. And the DVD is free. I just, uh, you know, pay for shipping and you can, four bucks or whatever and you can have it. I'm not selling it. Um, I... Yeah, I don't. I don't have anything against people selling things or anything. I just figure more people will watch it if I don't charge a lot of money. It's just I didn't have a way of putting like a five-hour film up online. It's pretty hard. Well, shoot, dude. Um, uh, I'll have to hook up with you on that. I'll put it on the website uh, as like a way of uh, you know a link to get to. So hey, you know, do you people uh, want to check out this? We'll put like some kind of an image up of uh, you know. Uh, yeah. The offering. If, if people want the text document, that's easy enough to find. It's right. Uh, nine eleven Iraq nine eleven PNAC, all roads lead to Israel. <laughs> and um, if people were shocked about that, because there have been also there have been some films that just blame like everything on the Jews, which I think is ridiculous. Um, Zionism is a cash cow for the military industrial complex. And it was central in 9/11. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, that's <laughs> that's why I say that because it's true. Israeli security sources are the ones who lied about anthrax being passed to from Iraqi uh, officials to Mohammed Atta in Prague. And it was Fred Barnes in the Peanut Cabal, published through the Weekly Standard and Peanut Ten Papers, saying also the same lies that Mohammed Atta met with Iraqi officials in Prague. They added the anthrax part to it. And then instantly it was in all these U.S. papers. You had Miller and them, you know, using their megaphone. John McCain went on David Letterman and said it, and then Cheney went on um, Meet the Press and said it. And so that is what connected Iraq to 9/11. And Iraq had nothing to do with 9/11. There was no meeting in Prague, and Al Qaeda didn't send the anthrax either. It came from our own labs. And so, and they knew that. They knew that in December of 2001. The FBI knew that, and the Justice Department knew that. But all the way until 2003, they were still repeating the lies. And Colin Powell's speech to the UN, where they evoked UN Resolution 1441, which is the technical legal aspect of why we invaded Iraq, is they weren't complying with that, to say that um, they had weapons of mass destruction. He used a mock file of anthrax and was repeating this lie that came from the Israelis. The other lies about WMDs, the chemical um, weapons under Saddam's palaces, and the mobile trucks that had biological weapons like VX gas and anthrax, which were repeated by Judith Miller in the New York Times and William Sapphire, originated, again, from the PNAC members, Gary Schmidt, William Crystal, Robert Kagan, and Fred Barnes, and then also Richard Pearl and Wolfowitz wrote about it. Uh, Wolfowitz in the San Francisco Chronicle and Richard Pearl in the op-ed in the New York Times. So this is the origin of these lies, and you have to trace it back to this cabal that if you look in the before 9/11, in the 90s, these neoconservatives, and they're not just neocons; these people worked in our government. They had positions in government and media. Pearl was the defense for policy. Uh, Wolfowitz was the number two guy in the DoD. Fife worked for Pearl in the OSP. They, they were in the Defense Department, the unelected portion of government. They have dual citizenship with Israel. Wolfowitz's sister lives in Israel. Fife's partner in Fife and Zell's law firm is an Israeli settler. Richard Pearl was an active arms dealer for Israel while he was working in the DOD. And that's what he's doing now. And he was caught in the 70s spying for Israel. And his underlings got fired over that. So these are moles for the Israelis. They had written all this propaganda verbatim about weapons of mass destruction and all the other nonsense before 9-11. When they got it again, the repeat of it, when Miller and you know Libby's girlfriend started saying this stuff in the New York Times, that was the same mythologies that they had already been writing. But until 9-11, nobody would bite on it. They said, oh, that's nonsense. Well, where's your evidence? And they said, oh, we have photographs of this meeting. And we have satellite photos of, uh, of um, weapons of mass destruction facilities and these trucks going around. That's what Powell was saying in his speech. There were no photographs. There were no facilities. It was all lies. But what people do is they just say, the Bush administration. It wasn't the Bush administration. It was specifically this peanut cabal. Yes, Bush was president while they were doing it. But that is who did it. 
And Cheney was very much a part of it. Cheney's one of the only guys that isn't a dual citizen with Israel as part of it, but he profits handsomely because of Halliburton, Kellogg, Brown, and Root. Um, uh, so th- th- a lot of these guys you're just talking about are all guys I used to listen to on the McLaughlin uh, group. <laughs> well, they're all in the Aspen Institute. They're all in the American Enterprise Institute. They all join the same uh, clubs, as if, but the central one with all of them was PNAC. The project for New American Century. Um, their media arms were Sapphire and Miller and the Weekly Standard, the Kagan and Crystal, and their their main guys in the DoD was Pearl because he has the whole data mining operative thing, and then Fife and Wolfowitz, and then in the office of the vice president was Lewis Libby. But there's also you know David Fromm, Bush's speechwriter that wrote the Axis of Evil junk. Um, there was. Elliot Abrams, part of Iran Contra as well. Uh, he was in the White House Iraq group. I mean, they're they're all over the place. But I just narrowed it down to the more familiar names because the people in positions of power have more influence than uh, the ones who just say were signatories in their letters or something. But you know, there was John Lehman and James Thompson who were part of PNAC, and they were on the 9/11 Commission. So if you want to talk about a complete joke, there you go. Thompson as well as with uh, one of the board of directors with Henry Kissinger and Richard Pearl for Hollinger, shown the Jerusalem Post and a lot of other media and spouted off plenty of lies. But this is a guy, there were so many conflicts of interest on the 9-11 Commission that it was actually as if they said, hey, how can we be worse than the Warren Commission? I know. <laughs> Let's do this. They almost They almost had Henry Kissinger lead it. He, he was he was the original pick to be the chairman of the 9/11 Commission, and he left because there were so many conflicts of interest. He would not reveal his clients his list his clients list. So um, one lady from um, the victims of 9/11 um, families asked him if, if one of his clients was last name was Bin Laden, and he actually fell off his couch and spilled his coffee. <laughs> Is he died? One of one of them is uh, Bin Laden's brother. So I mean, Kissinger is uh, he has the rap sheet so long going back to you know what he did in Chile and East Timor and Laos. It's just like, is there a man more evil on Earth? Maybe Pearl, maybe Berzovsky. I mean, you'd you'd be really narrow there at the top of the most evil people ever. Kissinger's got to be top five. I hate him. No question about it. Now let me say. All right, those are some fine details. Appreciate that. Uh, let me get back to more of a generalization. A couple things. Number one, the concept of Israel is anti-Judaic. So to call someone an anti-Semite who is against Israel is not uh, is, is misleading as well. Here's the thing: the God yeah. said that when the Jews, God will give the Jews uh, Israel. When it's time, in God's time, the Khazar Jews are the ones who are doing this, in my belief, is, uh, or, uh, who are at least uh, behind this. Like the Rothschild, the Rothschilds gave the money to build the Knesset in Israel. So you want to talk about the foundation blocks of this thing. There's just one example of many. But the point is, is that Israel is preempting itself. It's go- They couldn't wait. The Khazars are like, uh, are not Jewish, but they adopted Judaism in mass. Okay, they used to be a, a, a kingdom in Central uh, Asia. They got kicked out of there. They became nomads and went to Europe, uh, reconsolidated, and they want Israel now, and they're willing to do anything uh, to get it and maintain it and grow it. As uh, so, Jews are returning to a homeland, so they have a homeland and stuff like this. Okay, and it's a, uh, it's a fictional history, though. I mean. To me, it doesn't matter if you're Hebrew or part of the diaspora or whatever. I mean, there is an indigenous population living there, and they are murdering them and ethnically cleansing them. And that's wrong, and I don't care if you believe in Adam and Eve and Abraham and all, because in my book, those are fictional people. There is no bloodline. God didn't promise anything because God doesn't exist. To me, it's just humans killing other humans. I could care less if they're Khazaris or what have you. You cannot murder people. And if you are going to get into the religious thing and look at their own text, Israel is actually the new name for Jacob. It's a person and a bloodline, not a landmass. That is 
something they invented. That's why a lot of non-Zionist Jews say, no, Israel was Jacob. You know, he had the wrestling master, the angel, and all that. And all that chosen meant was they were chosen to spread the word of God, not of their God, not to um, murder everybody and create a racial state. It was never a nation. Even uh, the kingdom of David was one kingdom. It was not what you would con- what would be considered today as on the map all of Israel and Palestine. Well, those are- and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can't just say this is my land because my daddy lived here or whatever. I mean, yeah. it's you can't racially inherit land. You know, land is whoever is living on it. You know, they have property rights that are there. You cannot just bulldoze down someone's house and say six thousand years ago in this fictional story. Somebody related to me lived here of a different race, and you're not allowed to be here. I mean, that is freaking crazy. No matter who does it, it's this, it's the Nazi philosophy. Uh, same crap, new assholes. Uh, all right, now, but what I was trying to allude to was the fact is what is the motivation? What is the common thread that binds the activities of all those people that you just talked about? Perils, Abrams, the whole kick, Libby. The whole group of Zionist, uh, dual citizen, uh, Jewish men, Jewish supremacist Zionist males, and their Christian Zionist uh, co-conspirators uh, like the so-called born again Christian uh, George Bush, etc. Uh, mm-hmm. What are they? They're all bound by this, uh, uh, either uh, subconsciously or uh, or not uh, overtly. They're all working towards one goal. And that is the maintaining of the state of Israel, and in my belief is is that the whole thing about nine one one is to uh, f- basically false flag the Muslim people in the surrounding area to weaken them, to weaken any resistance uh, uh, to you know hey, central Israel, banking monopolies. <laughs> no, the Jews, are, the Jews or Zionist Jews or whoever you want to call them, they're new kids on the block. All the Muslims and Arabs have been living there for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, uh, one after the other. There's not a lot of immigration in and out of that. It's not like a bunch of Mexicans have moved there or something like that. Now, these people have a, a society built up over hundreds. Like, I remember the story about the guy showing that he had the, his mud building or whatever. He had a, a list, a 600-year-old list of all passing all right. from this one family member to the next. Th- their family has been in this house for 600 years. And the Palestinians the- are the Philistines. I mean, they talked about them in biblical times. They've- been there a very, very, very long time. And, right. But even if they had just moved there yesterday, you still can't just shoot people. I mean, or build a wall around them or segregate high schools by race or religion or whatever. You cannot – it is completely crazy to say our kind of people go to this school and you guys have to go to this other school. And you, why you can't go to school together? I mean, this is like 15th century type of morality where you're saying – uh we're going to colonize and build a settlement for Jews only. I mean, if you had a settlement for whites only and then outside in a wall in the ghetto where all the nine whites or something, I mean, that would be clearly seen as racist and immoral and just nuts. But and There would be every Jewish media outlet would be talking about it, impugning the morality of the white people involved, and lawyers of Jewish persuasion would be defending and prosecuting uh, things on behalf, uh, pro but, bono, on behalf of the, of the coloreds. But on the same and up, but on, on the same side of the mouth, they would go home and say, "Oh, but in our case, it's okay." You know, what we're well, doing. it all depends on what's in the American interest. You know, we'll support the monarchs in Saudi Arabia. We've been supporting the dictator in Egypt, uh, where it's Muslims. We've given uh, Pakistan dictator plenty of billions of dollars. It's only, it's only uh, they're only an evil dictator or whatever when it's not in the American interest. And it doesn't matter if they're Muslim, Jewish, Christian, or whatever. I mean, they'll kill Christians in Central America, no problem. They do not care. We've got the School of Americas down there murdering and assassinating people all the time. They're all, you're only on their team when it fits with their hegemony for economic interests. That for them, see, there is no difference between religion and economics for these people. Because for them, the religion is just a vehicle to create conflicts and war you know, because it is. I mean, you've got people arguing about different invisible men. People have been fighting over the city of Jerusalem for hundreds and hundreds of years. They ne- they don't want to let that go. That is the primary cash cow. And so it is in their interest to foster Zionist fanatics on one side and prop up uh, Islamic dictators and theocrats on the other side because they cannot and will not get along, and that is good for business because perpetual war is perpetual profit. 
the Galen dialectic explained as another example of it. I guess what I'm trying to say is is that um, uh, 911 uh, was all about weakening Israel's surrounding neighbors. And uh, remember, Saddam Hussein was a big. Uh, I mean, he was uh, you know trying to theoretically. I mean, uh, well, there's some evidence to suggest uh, you know from what I've seen that he was trying to build the cyclotrons and stuff to you know process their uranium, just like uh, Ahmadinejad is on the. Uh, a little bit higher uh, technologically advanced, but he's trying to do the same thing, and so that's why he's a threat. Uh, they got rid of uh, Saddam's uh, capability of doing that, and he's gone, and we don't hear about Ira Iraq trying to cyclotrons and stuff like that, trying to purify uh, the yellow cake anymore. Uh, so, but, uh, but that, they were. That whole uh, myth was, you know, the Niger forgeries and out of the Congo were terrible. I mean, they had an obsolete, obsolete foreign minister's name as the signature, uh, which is impossible. It would be like coming out with a document right now from the president and saying Jimmy Carter signed it or something. I mean, he isn't the president any longer. I mean, that is how bad that was. And Bush still included it in his State of the Union address. And then he, if, in case you think he's just Don Bush and made a mistake, he said it again in the speech in Ohio a month after that. Well, they're at to the point now that people don't – they know that people don't give a crap. So they don't even have to come up with uh, phony no, like, like here's, that. They just here's do a it. pretext. It doesn't matter how see-through it is. Just say something. I even remember right after the Iraq War, they said, oh, they moved the WMDs to Syria. <laughs> yeah, that was right. a good idea. They snuck yeah, them all out. The war. Why use your weapons? Give them to someone else. <laughs> yeah, and they yeah, actually said that. And, and considering how advanced the satellite technology would be to uh, observe and record such activities, uh, there has been nothing brought forward to uh, substantiate that claim that was made many years ago. I haven't heard that brought up recently. It's just like uh, – it's just the same thing with uh, – Why would you do it in the middle of a war too? I mean if you're going to give them away and you're not going to use them anyway, you could have given them before any of that even started. I mean the whole, the whole narrative is just retarded. We've had one guest come on here and say that actually the government did find them, but they uh, uh, confiscated them, hence the phosgene gas attacks. We have one guest on here that's – that uh, made that uh, idea. Uh, we've also had another guest on here that talks about something about the Gulf of Aden and how there's no shipping traffic around this one region. That surprisingly, when you have shipping traffic all over the world, but this area, Gulf of Aden, there's yeah, none. It's been almost cordoned off. Now he explains it as uh, it's a Stargate uh, type thing or something like that. But the way I see it is, I've looked at the map, and what you have is Gulf of Aden enters uh, the Red Sea enters uh, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, left-hand turn, you go to Egypt, right-hand turn, you go up a little straight, a little waterway that leads to the very tip of the uh, Negev Desert, Negev Desert, the, uh, the very tip of Israel. So it's Israel's back door uh, oh, through the waterway. The, the port of Aden in Botswana and Somalia and the port of Aden in Yemen are China's access into Africa because all the other ports have a Western presence. And that is why they use this pretext of, oh, Somali pirates or underwear bomber from Yemen and all this stuff as as a way of trying to gain control over those access points because they're having a massive resource war with China. However, a direct conflict with China is completely out of the question. Um, and, that's what, and there are plenty of traffic in the port of Aden. It's just not our traffic. Well, it's not track. In other words, there's websites that you can go to that shows you the uh, like a little uh, thing, a little. Uh, oh, there's no doubt it's not tracked because a lot of this stuff being imported and exported is from you know Chinese slave labor coming in and African slave labor going out. Yeah, so like these the ships that are tracked on these, like you go to different websites and you can see every boat is got like a little boat you know on the screen or something like that to correspond. Then you can click on, you can find the name of the boat and this that and the other thing. And it's all tracked all over the world. You can see all the shipping traffic going on presently. You know, I guess they got little trackers on them, just like a plane has a little tracker. You know, a little you know about the Zim shipping company getting busted sending arms to Iran in 2002. Yeah, the ones that left the World Trade Centers a week prior to the Israeli company shipping arms to Iran. A little suspicious, isn't it? They didn't make it. They got busted, but. A little known thing, you know, the same month later they had, a, well, no, actually it's in the same month they had a fake Al Qaeda ring busted in Palestine. The Israelis did fake Al Qaeda ring. Should that should be on the news? It wasn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how 
obvious it is. I mean, the lies about WMDs were terrible because you said it over and over and over, and then they didn't produce any. And you'd think, okay, you are completely caught now. They never clearly came out and said they did it on the web. But, I mean, you never going to hear Blitzer or any of the talking heads say, okay, there weren't any weapons of mass destruction. And furthermore, we were wrong. We never, not only were we wrong, we lied. Because it wasn't a mistake, it was a conscious lie. We knew the forgeries in his year. We knew that was a forgery. We knew it was fake. We knew there weren't any photographs of this meeting in Prague because there weren't any photographs. <laughs> you, know? you have to know. You, it was a you CIA failure. You're supposed to, no, the CIA, when it wants to get something done, it can get it done. Okay. The idea that was, was oh, the big CIA failure. It all went under the you know the noses of the CIA. Bullshit. No, it uh, they're part of it, and the FBI look at the case. Of the FBI went to Ames, Iowa, and destroyed the anthrax samples in the middle of an investigation for anthrax. I mean, stuff like that makes this almost a comical story. Where if it wasn't such a serious topic, but I mean, you look at the screw ups, and it is it wasn't difficult for me to find massive deceptions to put in this movie and like look at what they did there is no this isn't some vague thing uh that you might see in some other 911 films like well what if about cell phones on the plane would they work or not that's a, like a crappy argument it's like how about the people arrested in a truck pack with bombs just how about that on the same you know? very same day it just happened to be and had no connection at all I, I, oh, yeah, just because the Israelis who were working for a front company for the Mossad that got a half million dollar loan only during that month uh, get caught filming the first plane hitting. They've got over $4,700 stuffed in their sock. They're cheering. This is coupled with four other vans, one from aero, um, aero trucks, the other three from Urban Movings, all from, you know, uh, Suter who was fled to Israel and so on. Just – just a coincidence, you know, I often go to New York with uh, five grand in my sock and a camera and point it at buildings, you know, to document an event that I have ESP and I just know it's about that go down. And I and I happen to work for an intelligence agency of a foreign country with a spy ring of over 200 spies busted on the same day. That's all coincidence. <laughs> but church off, let them go, you know. And the other arrest, even with the cops arrested them, I talked to the cops that arrested them for the bombs in the George Washington Bridge and the Joint Terrorism Task Force took that over and quickly swept them out. There's a couple of pictures of the guys that we don't know who they are or anything. They got sent back to Israel. We know where the van was because of the callers reporting where it was going. So we know that was Urban Movings. But um and then there was another van that um I believe it was <sighs> NBC I have their clip in there, but he reported about the van being uh, found by police with explosive devices in it. That was near uh, World Trade Center 6, and uh, which is right underneath. Um, it wasn't Pat Dawson. Maybe Rick Sanchez or somebody was in there. But the police found a van with explosives in it at Ground Zero as well. And I'd really like to know if that van was urban moving or not. But the fact that you have all these truck bombs and van bombs everywhere is bad enough. Glenn Ford spotted another one, two Israelis with fake press passes, and they were also taking pictures. They are all positioned around the skyline, you know, across the river, just snapping away, smiling, loving it. They knew it was going down. They lived next door to the hijackers, but the whole hijacker story isn't really the hijacker story either. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's a long thing to explain, but it's that's why it makes sense. They never found the black boxes, all four of them. From World, uh, you oh, know, but you can find a paper passport twice. Yeah, it's just not. like that. You're supposed to. Let, no, the the people are buying anything, so that's why you don't even really need much of a story anymore. You just do it and throw something out there. Yeah, the clowns attack there, or whatever. And they're oh, okay, yeah, and uh, well, the name, whatever. The, the hijackers named were not dead, so obviously, the, if some of them didn't do it, you can safely say maybe none of them did it. You know, because it, it was a lot like the Oklahoma City bombing. With the Oklahoma City bombing, you had COINTELPRO embedded within these. There were some actual racist groups, and, but we had the FBI in there, supposedly supposed to be like a double agent pretending to be a neo-Nazi, but really they're going to bust them at the end. But in fact, they're pretending to pretend to be a neo-Nazi, but they really were. 
helping them construct the bombs, put them in the building. The truck bomb isn't even what took that all down. There are at least three more explosives in the building already that the FBI had set there uh, and prepared the other one. McVeigh was just a chump, you know, taking the blame for namesake. He's uh, he's dead now anyway. It doesn't matter. But the FBI set that whole thing up. And what we had here was you had the Mossad and these hijackers, some useful idiots from Saudi Arabia, but all the leaders of those cells were Israelis, and none of them got on their final flights on the planes. All right, let me ask you something. Uh, and I've uh, like some people point to WTC seven uh, as the smoking gun that shows, like you know, obviously you can see it's a scam by that. Uh, one thing I like to point to actually is uh, the Pentagon. Now you just mentioned something at the start about it. Let me just say that uh, I'd like to hear what you think about world tra- uh, about the Pentagon situation. Uh, I uh, communicate with, communicated with the dude from Judicial Watch for just a quick uh, little bit before, and uh, basically they got – only through a lawsuit do we have the images of whatever it is hitting the World Trade, Trade Center 7, those uh, images that were turned into a video slideshow basically, but they're just still images. And they, all, they those came out uh, in 2005 or 2006, and only as a result of a lawsuit uh, by Judicial Watch – uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, the government would plan on sitting in on that stuff without disclosing it. It would just have to take our word for it that something hit it. You know, we ain't going to see anything, even though there's all these cameras all over the place. And it, that, well, so I know where you're going with that. this. I can tell you this: an airplane hit the Pentagon. We know that. I'll tell you why they took the camera stuff too. But the reason we know is people saw an airplane at the Pentagon. There are parts of the plane in the Pentagon. There are parts of the people on that plane in the Pentagon. And the hole matches the size of an airplane, not a missile. There's a 100-foot span there on the bottom floor. They, what they did is they crop the – just where the fuselage went and took out part of the second floor, they always crop that hole, and they always have, like, water spraying underneath or something. They go, look, it couldn't fit in this tiny thing. And they're emitting, you know, this 190-foot-large span in there. There were parts of the plane up in. The reason they had to confiscate video and stuff is because just like in New York, they had secondary explosions. And if you look at the five frames they did release, on the fifth frame, you can see part of one of the other bombs going off completely separate. It's a good, I'd say, 80 so feet away from the impact zone, another fireball starting, and it cuts off immediately. You can see it. Check it out. It's just to the left of the orange cone um, and toward, toward yourself some. You can start to see the fire, and then you can see shadows from another flame where the shadows get longer on the um, the little wood thing with the arm. that I don't know what you call those. But you, you can see it. I've, I've broken the whole thing down. There were secondary devices. The secondary explosions were widely reported. The reason they hit that section of the Pentagon and the reason they killed the people on that plane, you look at the corporate financial officers like Jack Bryan and stuff who were on that plane who were killed were the same people who were investigating and auditing the $2.3 trillion that was missing. So they killed them, and the section they hit and bombed, they made, they reinforced that section and that section only to contain the explosions in here. 29 of the 30 employees who are part of the Naval Intelligence investigating the missing money, all dead. The other one is on a plane. Two of them are on the plane, actually. Uh, and a lot of their little underling officers were on there. It was weird that they are all on that flight. They're all dead. That is where the missing money is. They killed them. They killed the people on the plane, and they put people in that section. They had just moved them over there. They just finished renovating it. They made sure it was contained in there. They made damn sure none of them escaped because they bombed it. They have to confiscate the video because one of them went off prematurely, which you can see in the fifth frame of what they did release. Oh, uh, hold on. And, you say that in the remodel, they planted the explosives. When they were remodeling it, they would go ahead and put them in the walls and stuff. Because, and, I mean, they've been doing it for years. They've been remodeling it for years uh, is when it started. But they actually did the majority of the work just about three months before they moved them over. They put the people investigating the money. See, this this money goes back to uh, the ruble overhang and Bush. And the, the, when we were financing Borzovsky and Kordakovsky and all the rest of them um, for what went down in Russia, I mean, you have this uh, – Basically, you've got Minitep Bank and SIPNEF and all these this Zaibatsu of organizations working together in these rigged auctions to transfer the old communist property 
to oligarchs as private property without any venture capitalists or bidding or anything like that. It was just awarded to them uh, through these cases. And these guys take control over metals, oil, all the, the best resources in Russia. The USSR became Russia. And the U.S., through the Red Cross and all these other fronts, were saturating it with agencies. They were going to implode the Russian economy. They are the ones that helped Yeltsin in power. The guy was basically a drunk. Yegor Gaidar is the one who was really running the country as PM. And Yegor Gaidar is the one that brought in Boris Vorzovsky and the rest of them. Um, they, that is a long story. You should get uh, Godfather of the Kremlin. It's a good book about it. But this is this money, so, uh, false securities, fake, you know, all this fraudulent money and stuff, mostly for that operation. Like Iran-Contra and things like that were a minor compared to this. This was the big one, and this has involved Bush Sr. onward. You know, he he was very much hands-on in this operation. This money, uh, a good $240 billion of it alone just for for his faction, that was a massive scandal. And it's a massive financial scandal because some of the same banks, BCCI and all this, are involved in this operation I dug in and found this junk. This is why I can't stand it when people are like, I think a missile hit the Pentagon. I'm like, really? Do you have any evidence? Because everybody saw a plane go to the Pentagon. No well, one saw it fly away from the Pentagon. You know? <laughs> I, I have looked at this. Dan, I, could it be a smaller plane? Not the plane that we're all told hit the Pentagon, but a different It could be, but the thing is, whatever plane it was on, the people were on it. All those families aren't faking that their loved ones are dead. I mean, why? What is the motive? to use a missile or another plane or a flyover, why not just ram the plane into the building like you did in New York? I mean, they guided them in there, so I, it doesn't matter what the pilot did, because that, that, that was all stolen identities and things anyway. I mean, and uh, the flight school people are liars, because that those guys, like I said, were involved in the drug trade and everything else. You can't you can't trust them farther than you can throw them. This, this was disinformation, because that crap was fed to the producers of Loose Change before Loose Change 2. And they put it in their second movie because they wanted to ruin their credibility because their first film, which talked about secondary explosions, believe it or not, was an eye-opener for most people because most people knew nothing at all about 9-11. And it got them saying, okay, it's like a starting point, kind of like Jonestown. You go, okay, and then you just graduate from that, leave it alone, and go and research some more. They got torn to bits with that and the other guy I mean I don't like them anyway one of them just got caught with heroin in New York and Corey what's his face Roe I mean they're just dummies but it got heavily promoted because it was so full of disinformation that's why it was promoted because it said about the pods and the missiles and the other junk that's why it got went supernova other films that are more serious will never get that much attention and this missile faction is they vehemently hate my guts, you know, but I'm like, where's your evidence for a missile? Not lack of evidence for a plane. Where's your evidence for a missile? Okay, you don't have any. You don't know where it came from. They, they tracked the plane doing a loop around Virginia. There wasn't a missile flying around in a circle in northern Virginia, okay? <laughs> Millions of people would have seen it. It was an airplane. They crashed the plane. The people on that plane are dead. They found their DNA in the crash site. There's parts of a plane. I mean, to deny it is to say, well, they planted the plane parts. They faked the DNA evidence. All those witnesses are lying, over 50 of them. Um, the firemen and stuff, they're all just in on it. I mean, you got to really have a lot of ad hoc hypotheses to cling to the missile or whatever. Now, it could be a smaller plane, but then you have to explain what happened to the victims um, because they are dead. They're not pretending they're dead. And then you'd still have to say the DNA was faked, and you still have to explain why are they finding parts of a Boeing 757 in the building, and I guess you could say that's fake too. But, I mean, keep it simple, stupid, is the usual philosophy. I think the reason there's parts of Boeing 57 and DNA and that everybody saw it is because they did crash the plane into the building. There's no reason not to. They did it in New York, did it in Pennsylvania. So I don't know why they would switch it in D.C. Okay, I'm uh, fine. I mean, there's one thing I want to say right there is um, – in this truth movement, uh, no matter what you're talking about... Uh, Hold on, one more thing. It also prevents people from looking to the Z into Z Zakim and the remote software from Britannia and Boeing. Um, there's also a lot of evidence for that. A lot of the Raytheon employees and things that make the 
the drone tech software at that time were deeply involved in this, all made massive financial profits through put options and so forth. So there were people who knew that's some other evidence on my side. And it prevents people from going down that path because, yeah, how could a pilot take that turn and hit? That is mysterious. He didn't. They were not going to – hitting the World Trade Center is even harder. I mean, the Pentagon is over 900 feet long. The Trade Centers are barely bigger than a plane. True. But, and so You're those going in there pretty hard. quick, and so you have to line up on it. It's they were flying – yeah, they were zinging in there. You'd have to really line up to hit those. You cannot risk missing that. And to me, that was even harder to hit than the Pentagon, regardless of the angle they took. Because if you're off by a little bit, you'd only if you hit just with the wing or something, it's not going to do anything. You got to plant center of the plane in that building or in the corner of the building, which is what they did. And the floors that they hit, if you look at the floors that they hit, the, the Fitzgeralds and stuff. I went over this in my film too. The massive reinsurance companies and things were hit first. And then you have the secondary bombs go off at the base at the same time. They trap those people of the deaths of the, you know, the 1,200 in one building and the rest in the other. Uh, the disproportionate number, like 900 out of 1,200 and stuff, are from these reinsurance companies. Those floors and the floors right above them were the targets of the planes. They, <laughs> they just hit the building. They hit specific floors. Just like the Pentagon, it hit a specific section where the financial tracing would go, well, all those computers and people were killed. So that is drone tech. That is not a pilot. No pilot can do that. Um, and saying this missile junk prevents people from looking into, okay, who builds that, who profited from it. it you don't look into it anymore because you think you already have an answer or you shot a missile into it. They did not shoot missiles in New York, obviously. You can say the plane got two inches away from it and then shot a missile or something if you want to just be, you know... <laughs> If you're just going to never let that die or something. But no, they hit it with the planes. There were bombs in the building. I mean, I, I even traced back to the fake elevator companies and things they were using, the fake sprinkler system guys. They were caught in Tennessee. The lady that gave them the fake IDs was killed in a car crash the day before her trial and so on and so on. I mean, that's what happened. And uh, I can back mine up with empirical evidence. All I ever hear from the missile crowd or flyover crowd is, you know, excuses about lack of evidence of a plane. They don't have any evidence for what they want to say. Well, like I said, uh, it's with, within the truth movement, uh, every, every everybody charges the other truthers uh, or researchers with uh, being actually agents of disinfo. Sometimes that's why I come on here. I call, I, I play with that. I just, yeah, I'm working for the CIA. I'm deep undercover, you know. And as a matter of fact, I'm <laughs> hit out on any of my critics or something, you know. <laughs> Player, listen, bottom line, we're all moving in the general same direction, but we can't resist from bashing one another for, uh, you know, uh, either out, uh, intentional disinfo, it's like we're all like agents or something, uh, or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, our opinion that everybody else is an idiot or something like that. I think that, uh, listen, something is extremely fishy about all of this. Okay, that's, right. we, we all can agree on that. Now, how it all uh, came out? Well, I mean, uh, it's research, uh, good advanced research on the subject can uh, start pointing things out that makes sense. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm all for that. Let's put oh, the overall thing. This is just part of a Rubik's Cube spin. Okay, the 911 was a big uh, – we're trying to get uh, the Rubik's Cube going here. So yeah, but there's a problem, though, with the disinfo. Like, one is backed by evidence, the other isn't. And when people go around talking about missiles and stuff – it makes other people who are not 9-11 truthers, who aren't so open-minded, just roll their eyes and go, oh. And that yeah. it just paints the conspiracy as some some quacky thing like, uh, you know, saying Elvis is still alive or something. Right, right. Because, it, because it, that's it, what it does. And I left them alone for like eight match. years. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Now I attack them because that's, it Yes, I understand that concept. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to have free speech. You have to have let all these people. Yep. I wish they would quit bashing each other even though – I know that they want to preserve the credibility of the movement, so to speak, or, or, or the genre, or however you want to look at it. The uh, you know, to, so that you know, the people that you haven't convinced, the, the choir that you are not preaching to, uh, will uh, you know, uh, you know, view you with the credibility, and, 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 and you know, so you can engage them. You know, and so it, it, it isn't little green men if, if you're talking about UFOs, it, it, you know, analogous to that. There were some that even said that the planes in New York were fake and it was all blue screen. I've even heard there were lasers from outer space and all kinds of junk. I mean, Absolutely. all that is 
all of that is disinfo, all of it. And it's all coming from the same places, too. And just look at what's so heavily promoted. Why was loose chain so promoted? Why was these missile thing? Why was Pentagon strike went around viral? I mean, my sister saw that. She's 12 years younger than me. It was hitting in middle schools and stuff is where they aimed that at. I mean, and it's, it's just like no evidence at all. It's just saying, look at the hole. Well, okay, you only showed part of it. So all you got to do is say, well, look at the rest of the hole, and that argument ought to die right there. But it doesn't because the people have invested so much of their ego into it and all that they just can't let go. That's what I'm talking about. Here's here's the way I look at it. My my personal belief on it is I, I let the people talk when they come on the show. I'm not trying to agree with them. I'm not trying to get into a fight with them. Uh, I might try to ask them questions, but I let them speak their piece. And I don't uh, think that's this info. I just think that's a radio and having uh, people a uh, free speech. Oh know. yeah, yeah. I I, I, I agree with you. That's good. You should side. definitely have. Ultimately, that. you have to, ultimately you have to be like yourself care enough to do your own research and prove it to yourself. All we could try to do on this show or any other of these shows that are similar, uh, you know, Alex Jones or whatever, is to give you an inclination to, to you know, peel back the thin veneer of bullshit and look at what's underneath. And you only do that if you convince yourself. And so these are just like little ticklings. It's a little, it's a little way to, uh, you know, hey, something's over here, and then run off. And then the, the person will be like, well, say, well, what, what was he talking about? And then you begin to get into it and then do it yourself. And then pretty soon you realize that uh, this is not as all what it seems, you know. Mm-hmm. And so then – that's what, so, the, so the, the people out there will have to listen. And they, listen, when I first heard about 911 being an inside job for the first two or three years, I thought they people were whack too, okay? But then I began – What brought you What brought you around on it? I'm curious. Oh, uh, at least initially, I uh, think that's a good question. Uh, I can't remember at this point. I can't remember. Uh, the things that I would just say that uh, still, you know, are in my mind is, uh, you know, d- I think World Tri- uh, WT7. That, yeah, I think that's uh, a big one. But I've heard a really good argument. There was a video on YouTube. It's not there on anymore, and I can't, I've been trying to fucking find it. Yeah, I cannot find it. They had. It was a Jewish man who was the actual architect for World Trade Center. He actually was the – it wasn't the company hired to do it. It was actually the architect assigned to it who did the work on it. And he mentioned that World Trade Center uh, 7 was cantilevered over the top of the Edison uh, tunnel, and there was like a – there was a big void essentially underneath World Trade Center 7. And he said what happened was is that's why it was it, it collapsed in like a house of cards was because it was not a t- there wasn't a solid foundation under it like a, a piece of dirt under it there was a void under it and that's why it collapsed easier than it would have otherwise and I thought well that's a darn good uh, you know counter argument to the whole uh, thing but that aside no because the penthouse starts breaking first and then it right, breaks down the, in the, the middle crumple zone and everything like that I see we're, yeah we're if, the, if you pulled out something from underneath it would all go fuck at once as that no. It was still on the ground, and there wasn't a void underneath it because there's still street now. When you clean up the debris, there's no hole. There's still a road. No, but the whole thing, then when you go, then when the, uh, I mean, there's so many inconsistencies. But if they've, they've always found the black boxes. There was two in each plane. They didn't find all four of them. That's the story. That has never been done in the history of flight. Okay. The, now, I believe they found the one in Pennsylvania, but they won't release the information on it. What's the, oh, yeah, what's up with that then? There's just so many Well, you know things. why. <laughs> yeah, we know. Right. So, obviously, okay, but all right, again, this is just a Rubik's Cube. What I want was just a spin of the Rubik's Cube to get them all the blue ones on one side. We still got the uh, maze of colors to put, uh, we want to get the orange. Ultimately, when the cube is uh, fully done, the full Rubik's Cube, who's uh, actually uh, invented by a Jewish guy, uh, is about Israel canceling out all potential enemies in its region and having a safe, stable area. And if you look at it, uh, and the people that are working the hardest at it, that's what their desire is. They are not true Jews of the Torah, but they're more of the Talmud. And so that is what this is all uh, their concern is. And so they kind of, uh, the, the payback to the American people, the overall justification for getting involved in this thing, okay, to uh, help them in their Israel, is that we ha- we have to be fair about this. I, 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 this is very important in all the bashing of the Fed and everything. Okay, is that we have been leaning on the Fed as Americans 
for a long time. We've been using their central banking scheme, their, their, their business model, all right, and they, especially at this time, they are buying all of our paper. They are uh, leveraging the credibility, so to speak, of their enterprise on us. And I don't know whether they're going to be able, able to sustain it. But we've been living on our means one way or the other, whether engaging in wars and the welfare state, et cetera, et cetera. And the only reason why we we're doing that because they have this business model, the people that own the Fed, that will allow for it. So we right, but when they say we, it. when they say we live behind beyond our means, um, the majority of that living beyond our means isn't uh, you and I. You know, we don't live in the U.S., but um, it's not the common person. It's the warfare welfare state. The trillions that were spent by these speculators and gamblers and things, this is a small, tiny, tiny fraction. It's two-thirds of the money, but is a small, tiny fraction of people who are doing this using counterfeit money to pay for gambling. But the trillions are thrown into the Defense Department and the Department of Homeland Security and all the other related so-called defense-orientated uh, military industries. And... You look at the billions missing, even cash in Iraq. It just went missing. There's supposed to be a project. They say build a bridge. No bridge comes. Money's gone. Who has it? Gee. And they won't let an, us have an, a full audit on the Fed. The partial one that was finally done, we learned that $9 trillion, with a T, was used by the Fed to prop up Bank of America and all these other foreign banks. Right. Why? Because of the gambling habits, you know. Bank of America also got a thirty billion from TARP money, which they use for bonuses, and they also got Countrywide's bailout money as they acquired Countrywide while it was floundering. Then it got the bailout while it was merged with Bank of America, so they ended up with that money too. I mean, it is the largest financial scam in history. Uh, it flips back and forth. Okay, first off, it's okay. First off, the American government says, "Okay, you can do our money for us." So the Fed. Uh, it's, it's passed. Uh, the law is passed. They take over for doing our money for us. And then uh, the, uh, they want you to support Israel uh, through your infrastructure, through your people, through your system and everything like that. So we agree to that. And then they flip it back on us and say, okay, we'll give you, uh, you know, you can spend me on your means uh, and, and, and all the different ways. The, mo the overall thing is for America is that we get to be number one through this system. We get to have bases all over the place. We get to have that presence. We get to have empire, and that's the trade-off that we get as Americans. That we don't get to enjoy it, you know, necessarily personally, but overall, that is what we get out of it. We get to be number one in the world. You know, the, 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 we are number one. We dictate. We're the we're the uh, rulers of the world, basically. Okay, that's what we are. We have been for some time. Not for well, obviously, you're going to put your financial hub in whatever country has the strongest military. Because that's the one that can enforce everything they want to do. And so, and it's part the United of being, States. Okay, so yeah, so part of being number one is having this huge military. That's part of it. That's a military industrial conflict. Now the money gets uh, filtrated out to all and put in pockets and everything. Now we flip it back to the central bankers. We flip it back to them and say, okay, now we we're in debt to you, and so now the people of the country are going to pay taxes to you to pay off the interest on this debt. So we're back into debt slavery. You own us uh, via uh, you know, the collateralized uh, bonds, etc. Uh, that's how we got – so let's flip back to them. They say, okay, you know, so, so it's a, it's a, this is symbiotic give and take, give and take, give and take, okay? And it's been working fine. Now there is a threat to it uh, which between China and Russia, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They recognize what's going on. Okay, they're not a bunch of deluded Christian Zionists or apathetic Americans who are just interested in uh, Beyonce slapping her butt cheeks or something like that. They have a, a greater sense. They want to be number one or they want to be, uh, you know, uh, control their own destiny. They don't want a bunch of Zionist Jews telling them which way is up or whatever. And so they are formulating a plan to uh, counter this. Okay, that's the ultimate thing here. So uh, at what point... Uh, Will the central bankers, the Zionist Federal Reserve out of New York, give up on America and stop right. buying the bonds and start bringing, a, uh, you know, maybe never. Maybe they're uh, – They, they could care less. I think in China, Russia, and the United States, the elite aim to wipe out the middle class so they can rule with impunity as global oligarchs. 
I mean, a lot of these things are multinational. They don't have uh, any particular loyalty to a piece of dirt. Um, they love Israel because Israel is our main cash cow. I mean, the, if remove Israel, and you would not be able to hold down the vastness of the Middle East. I mean, that perpetual war and threat, um, going in and blowing up Iraq's nuclear reactors, threatening Iran and so forth, we would not be able to hold them in a state of stagnation without that presence. I mean, that is our... It's an extension of our own military, you can speak, the, the nasty wing that doesn't even have to hide what it does. Okay, so you but, see some use in the whole thing. You see that this is a good plan because it's uh, it's nullifying uh, the Persian Empire from regenerating itself into uh, a threat against the Christian uh, world. Well, I don't think that's good, though. I mean, I don't think there's... I don't care if they're a threat to the Christian world or not because those are just ideas. I just see it as they want a, an... They don't want any economic or military rivals to threaten their place at the top right now, and this isn't for us. You know, and, uh, the Persians and the Arabs, they're not a threat to me. They're not a threat to you. They're not a threat to my business or anything either. It's just the elite are afraid. I mean, they're sitting on all the oil over there. I mean, it's not all of it, but you know. And we want to control that. We do the same thing in South America. I mean, it is our companies going down, back telling the rest of them, you know how the – economic hitmen work. We go in, we get bribed or threaten a leader into these deals where they're just stuck paying perpetual debt and it's neo-colonialism. We do it in Africa as well. We get all these resources, we turn it into finished products and sell it back to them. When I say we, I don't mean you and I. I'm talking about just these quasi-government corporations because they're highly subsidized. A lot of the agribusinesses and things getting farm subsidies. Drug companies are getting subsidies. It's, it's socialism for the rich. Um, well, it's almost communism, but it's, it's not communist because they have private property. It doesn't really fit any of those definitions cleanly. But what you have is statism. It's this mercantile. The state is awarding companies these lucrative contracts and dumping the debt onto the third world. And the way we're messing with the Middle East, Israel is our prime attack dog. And we have a symbiotic codependency with Saudi Arabia for the oil and the petrodollar. We arranged that after OPEC uh, raised our gas prices 130%, which was a result of us aiding the Israelis during Yom Kippur. We are going to aid them in Yom Kippur. Israel has had the U.S. by the short hairs ever since LBJ was president because of the Kennedy thing. They knew about it and they ran on it. He, he's the one, you know, Eisenhower had the peace treaty with UN troops there between uh, Egypt and Israel for 10 years and that war that started the reason they were there in the first place because of the Levon affair the false flag operation the Israelis did and that was in tandem with the British because the British didn't want to lose the Suez Canal Nasser becomes sworn in as the new premier of Egypt he told them to take a hike got the Russians in the Soviets started building the Aswa Dam he nationalized Egypt's Suez Canal it is theirs it is in Egypt the Brits didn't like that, so the Israelis went around bombing Western targets and tried to blame them on the Egyptians. Uh, Nathaniel, what's his face, his bomb went off in his jacket. They searched his house, found out it was all IDF operation. Um, and it didn't matter because in the following year, the French and British and Israelis attacked Egypt anyway in the 1956 war that none of them ever liked to mention before the Six-Day War. And that is what Eisenhower came in for the peace treaty, put UN troops to patrol the border between Egypt and Israel. Israel is getting the majority of its oil at this point from the Sinai Peninsula and from Iran. They end up losing their access in 79 for Iran, which is why Iran-Contra started. But when they get in there, the day that, that LBJ gets in and he removed the UN peacekeeping troops, and that was in uh, May – and June 5th, Israel attacked Egypt. Just a couple, uh, less than a week later, they attacked. They said Egypt was built, using troops on their border. Russian satellites photos show otherwise. And then, again, they had a false flag operation in the USS Liberty attack in 67, which they, again, tried to blame on the Egyptians. They were survivors, so then they went to their fallback story and said, okay, we bombed it, but we thought it was an Egyptian boat, not an American boat, and fight the big American flag. And we just decided to use unmarked planes. And you know, The story falls apart, but it doesn't matter. I mean, they got caught in the Levon affair. Levon had to retire. They got caught in the USS Liberty. It didn't matter. And, you know, and as soon as the Egyptians um, 
remove their troops from Palestine, from Gaza, the Israelis re-entered and reoccupied. And UN passed Resolution uh, 242 to saying that's illegal to get out of there, and the Israelis just ignored it, and they continued building settlements in the West Bank. So that's a quick history of Israel. But it's been one false flag after another. First it was about the Suez Canal. Uh, it's about Israelis' oil interests and so on. But keeping this conflict going between Egypt and Israel, and also from Syria at a defense pack. I mean, this this whole Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Israel, Nexus is a massive cash cow for the military-industrial complex, not only ours, but of their own. And that's why we paid billions and billions of dollars to put Mubarak in there. We finally assassinated Egypt's le- leader in 81 and, and got our dictator in there. He's been there for 30 years. Uh, well, right now he's in a little bit of trouble. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, the reason we pay them off, we've paid them off and for 30 years. But you look at the history prior to that, Egypt was on, man. They were telling the Israelis to stick it. And Israel gets the majority of its oil from that small portion that they occupied illegally of Egypt because they cannot get it from Iran anymore because they lost that. They had that from 54 to 79 with the Shah once he got a permanent vacation to Egypt (laughs) where our new dictator was. And then what happened in 1979? We put Saddam in power out of Egypt. He lived in Egypt first and we put him in there, part of the Ba'athist. To fight the communists was our pretext. That's not the real reason. It was Israeli interest. And what does Saddam do? He gets in power in 79, and from 1980, for the next eight years, he went to war with Iran. And what happened during that war? The U.S. financed, not only gave weapons to Iraq, but also to Iran. And Israel gave weapons to Iran. To, As uh, Odin Yedin said in his policy papers, he is the grandfather of PNAC. He's like before that even keeping this Arab Persians, you know, murdering each other was perfect for the Israelis. Uh, it tore both countries apart. Iraq was the victor. And then in 91, we invaded them and finished them off. And, of course, we said it's because of the Kuwait. You know, that whole story of the babies and incubators was another lie. It's always by deception. War is by deception. But it's, these were for Israeli interests. These, because Israel is a, a tiny piece of crap country. No, We don't need them. They're just there. 60% of their economy is based on security. They cannot let go of war. They are completely dependent on it. And that is why they have you know, racial colonization and so forth. And the other thing is they enjoy the religion card as well as the Holocaust card, which I'm not going to get into right now, but as a way of stifling criticism. You know, you Not only do you have the race card, you have a religion card and the Holocaust card. So if you criticize Israel... For ethnic cleansing, which ought to mean we could criticize South Africa for it, but not Israel, because of the unique nature of, you know, it's, it happens to be Jews, and because of World War II, and blah, 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 then you you just seem like a Nazi or whatever. And uh, that's just not the case. They're murdering little kids and women and poisoning the ground with depleted uranium. It is a disgusting state. Uh, it's not all the people there. I'm talking about the government, but a lot of the people do support it, but that's also because they've been brainwashed since they were two years old to follow this Zionist ideology. Um, It's not very uh, unlike the old colonists that murdered American Indians and stuck them on trains, stick the Apache on trains and send them to concentration camps in Florida. I mean, that was 1903. Um, These people are amoral psychopaths. They do not care. It's It's hard for people like us to understand the mindset of how you could just abuse people like this Right. Just playing like you know global chess games. Don't let that stop you from the truth, though. Just because you no, could relate just, to it doesn't mean it's not <laughs> so. <laughs> I, just, I just think about it. I'm like, okay, what would Pearl do? Like, you know, if you were completely amoral and crazy and wanted to make a buck, you know, then you could see how uh, a person like Henry Kissinger works and what they think about. I mean, and they, you have no care for the afterlife. You're not even. No. Uh, you, you've dismissed all that as a possibility. Because, you know, if there is an afterlife and there is a judge at the end of the day, worse, you worse, are screwed. <laughs> worse than that. Worse than that. They do have an afterlife, but the, the ultimate judge is the devil, not God. <laughs> yeah, they're really up on creek. I mean, it's evil. I mean, it, it, what is worse than depleted uranium? I mean, giving radioactive poison to babies. Can you think of something nastier than that? I mean, that's, you know, it's murder, but it's a certain kind of murder. I can't think of anything worse than indiscriminately poisoning newborn children with radiation and giving them massive deformities and death. I mean, that's, I, I don't know. Like, And then they, we torture people, we've got renditions, 
and that includes rape and sexual torture and blowing out people's eardrums and all that. I mean, Abu Ghraib, the pictures they released, this is another, um, you know, throwing a bone tactic. They showed the naked pyramids and stuff. Well, that was the most mild thing they could have shown. They acted like, oh, this is it. And they always talk about waterboarding, which, you know, if you put a spectrum of torture, that would be on the far end of it of, you know, mildness, whereas the other end would be, you know, like medical testing and stuff. And, you know, waterboarding is torture, but I don't want to get caught in a long debate about, you know, how bad is it to be waterboarded because that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about torture. When we're talking about torture, we're talking about them electrocuting genitals and things like that, which have been caught doing. And our Congress, a certain section of them, got to see those photos, got to hear the rape tapes. You know, they actually made tapes of people moaning and screaming and crying and stuff. For You know, they made audio tapes of it, like to listen to, to blow steam. That is truly psychotic. But these guys from Blackwater and these outsourced privateer mercenary groups that they, they use in Air Z and uh, Dying Corn, Triple Canopy and so on, they don't care. These these people, I've met some of them, they, you know, they married into the Amway family and all. They are holy roller fanatics. And to them, a Muslim is not, basically not even a human being. I mean, they're just like, well, they're going to hell anyway. So I mean, if God's going to torture them, so can I. <laughs> well, here, let me say something. Hold on. Since you're such a, uh, I mean, you're an uh, incredible, uh, you know, researcher, from what I can understand, uh, talking with you and everything like that, which is great, you know. Uh but when you're talking about, I just throw this out there, uh, that's also true. When you, with respect to Caucasian people coming to the uh, North America and the laying waste, not entirely, but pretty well, not as good as uh, Japanese uh, or a, as they were known before, Chinese uh, people went to the islands of Japan and uh, laid waste to the Inoue people, etc. Uh, the Caucasians, when they went to uh, North America, Christopher Columbus, post Christopher Columbus, etc. Oh, they wiped uh, out 100% of the Caribbean. That's pretty bad. <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, yeah. Let me yeah. just finish this. When, when they came to uh, America, North America, you know, this, in these United States, and began uh, genociding out the Indians by hook and crook, like you were saying, the, the blankets full of uh, you know disease and everything like that. The whole, whole, yep. Yeah, the whole thing. The fact is that there were Caucasian people living in the Americas before and at the same time as the so-called Native Americans. And the fact is that, that the so-called Native Americans genocided out the Caucasian people that were here. So in my respect, with, with respect to that, I have no sympathy at all for any single Indian in America because they already did a perfect job on the Caucasians. That's a lot of things. This is talk about something that not a lot of people know about, but I do because I've done my research in this. Every year, they're hold on now. So you're gonna you're gonna collectively damn people, many 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 generations removed who had no part in murdering anybody, for what may have happened before, just because they belong to the same type of race. That's I'm not gonna not. feel sorry for them. That's what I mean. I'm not gonna. Feel I don't think genocide is right ever. You know, even if Germans kill lots of Jews, it doesn't give the right for Jews to kill someone else. You know. And I do not believe at all that Caucasians lived in the United States, what's now the Americas. You don't believe Native that. Okay, so there's a, there's I have not seen any evidence of that ever. Okay, I, uh, all right. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just cite just one instance of it. But, uh, but back to what I'm going I'm, I'm to cite. One instance of it to you, because I know you can respect this and everything like that. Uh, Dude, if I see so, evidence, I will totally let well, the world know. But okay. I don't well, see any. My point is, is that I don't feel sorry for them. I don't have a sympathy for them. I don't have a sympathy vote for the Holocaust victims because I know that it's a Hegelian dialectic. I know Jews, uh, Jewish elite, uh, Zionist elites, sold out their own race. Okay, so I'm not buying into this feel sorry for it type of thing. I don't feel sorry, for example, uh, Japanese killed in uh, Hiroshima because what they did to the Filipinos and what they did to the Chinese and what they did, or and I don't feel sorry for Vietnam. Uh, Chinese. This is, here we go. It's a, it's a All right. <clears throat> the Japanese military bombed Pearl Harbor and killed people in the Philippines. The people living in Hiroshima did not do that. The people in li living in Hiroshima chose not to join the military. And these are just like kids and women and stuff. You can't collectively damn the, the entire race Never of people because them. of what some no, other people no, that happened to belong to it did. I mean, as an American, oh, well, your country went and killed all these Iraqis, so if someone kills you, it shouldn't have sympathy. You know, like, I, you didn't do it. No, I know. The country you live in did it. It doesn't matter because 
still get blamed for it. When I go overseas, or when you go overseas, they might uh, say, well, we understand it's your government doing that, you're, you're doing it. But let me tell you something. That did not save Rome from the Vandals and the Visigoths, your uh, very, uh, you know, uh, rational and uh, forward-thinking type of aspect on this whole thing. is not to blame, only blame those individual parties. But in the end, the whole thing does get blamed on the race, and they do get taken out. That's what happens. Now, let me uh, just say that. So the, those Roman it, people were still alive. They just weren't under the same government anymore. Here's the fact on the uh, issue with American, uh, uh, I'm saying, 60 Minutes, number one, uh, did two stories on it, okay? That's how I first learned out about it, okay? It's called Kenwick Man. It's a 9,000-year-old mm-hmm. skeleton, nearly complete, found in Washington State, that uh, washed up. It was, it was just like a miracle. It's, it's almost a complete skeleton. Uh, there's this thing, this pre-Columbian act, that anything before 1492 automatically belongs to the Indian tribe in that locale. So this Indian tribe tried to uh, claim the bones. They said it's our people. A scientific group said, no, wait a minute. This doesn't look like something we, anything we've ever seen before. We want to study it. There was like almost a 10-year court battle on it. It went all the way to the Ninth uh, uh, District Court of uh, Shlemiel's, which is the very liberal uh, version in uh, you know out of San Francisco. Yeah. After after this lengthy court battle, and this movie you wouldn't hear, but the judge the judges ruled that the Indians could provide uh, and, and prove no ancestral link to this skeleton, so it was remanded to. Uh, science, and they have now it has its own museum and everything like that. It established that these bones did not belong to anybody that was Indian. In fact, it, every indication was it was European. From the teeth, the, uh, they can do sampling, they can take a little shaving, and they can do uh, analysis off that. There's so many different ways of scientifically doing this. The fact is that's just one instance. Every year they're digging up bones. That, that was a 9,000-year-old skeleton, a Caucasian in North America 9,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. There's two books out there written by American Indians, a male and a female, from uh, the late 1800s that say, that tell stories that there were Caucasian people even back in the 1800s in North America and that, that their tribes hunted them down and killed them. Okay? This is not oh, we know they were there in the 1800s. No, they, but they weren't. They were in. <laughs> they were native Caucasian people, believe it or not, in North America, according to American Indian accounts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, sixty minutes also did a story about finding Noah's Ark. So I don't care what they said. A nine thousand year old skeleton. There's something to look into, but you're talking about fifteen thousand years at least for the natives being there. There's several waves. There were, like, if you look at the Inuit, the Eskimo, our there's not one Native American group. I mean, that one's from the Ainu and are Asian. There is Siberians who came over and so forth. Um, but regardless, to discount genocide because of what may have happened thousands of years before that, that we don't know how to have any people, is is really crazy. I mean, that's not who did it. You, you can't collectively damn but they get racist the benefit, people though. for that. If I take you out... If I take out your tribe, and then a, and we get to uh, keep the land and everything like that, and it's it's basically the raise, it's, it's the Israeli thing all over again, okay? Uh, yeah, but you don't know that if it was genocide or if people were bred out. You know, if there's ten thousand of people in one tribe and a hundred in another, that's what happens to generations. Ten, huh? Ten thousand years ago, believe me, I, I can pretty much state, uh, state that those people were more vicious and base. Uh, and uneducated. They had no schools back then of the type that we think of today that talk liberal education. I don't think liberal education uh, prevents savagery at all. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> you would think so. I have to agree with you. But amongst the general peons, it seems to have quelled it uh, quite a bit. But, but See, a lot of explorers, when people go from one area to another, they're predominantly and almost exclusively entirely male like what you had with the Croatoan, because let's take the first English that came to America before Jamestown and so forth, lived with the Croatoan. They brought over two women and 105 men. And what happened there was the men married 
American Indian women because there was nothing else available. And over generations before Lawson and their explorations came down in the 1600s to find these Indians with blue eyes and stuff, they were not murdered out. They were bred out. And if you, you're not bringing – when if you're going to have explorers, some Phoenicians or whatever, I mean, I've even heard stories that there were, you know, in ancient times people had come to the Americas. If you're not coming as a colony, if you're coming as explorers and you only have one sex, then you're, you're genetically going to disappear through time. Okay, here's what I mean to say by this. is that is it, Let's say there's two tribes, like there were in North America, I believe, at the time, uh, thousands of years ago. There were the Caucasians and there were these uh, so-called American Asi- or Asiatics that had came across the land bridge as we're taught. Okay? Uh, and you see, I don't believe that either. That okay, land, that's, well, that's, that's the popular theory. I, who knows really what yes. it is? But let's just say that because that's the common theory that most people can uh, you know, relate to. That's what we at least were taught, okay? Uh, at least about the land bridge thing, not about the Caucasians being here, but there's a lot of evidence to prove that. Uh, you know, went up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Shlomil, so I mean, they're you know, they look, they're used to looking at evidence. Anyways, uh, there's any, wherever you are, there's two sides. I genocide out your people, so only my ethnicity is there. And that makes my grandchildren innocent of the whole thing. And they're just beautiful people. And never mind that they took something from somebody else a few generations ago. That's, I, that's very noble to think in those terms. But that does not carry the day over time. Because other cultures have vengeance. They have memories. And if yours doesn't, then you lose. Uh, but if you have a germ of your ethnicity, you'll try to remember and, and take revenge. This happened with the Vandals and the Visigoths. Back to that whole story, how Romans uh, dealt with the Germanic tribes and how it came back to uh, bite them in the ass. It's similar to America because we're starting shit with all these other countries uh, under the same auspices. You know, we're going to take you out, but that doesn't mean our grandchildren are innocent. That's not how the other people look at you. The other people look at you. Oh, you Americans came here. Huh? Ask the Filipinos. They hold us. They never. T- they never. Uh, they never talk crap about the Spaniards who came and conquered them for like 500 years. They only try to lean on Americans for uh, conquering them. That's the, I've had so many conversations that they, they bring that That's up. More, they, it's more you recent. They colonized us. You. They, they say, you colonized I said, shit, I wasn't even bored. No, but they hold me accountable. I'm just bringing up this concept that you have to – it's reality. It may not be how I necessarily look at it, but I'm bringing it up because who, – Who in the world holds somebody at ill from something that may have happened – Hold on, hold on. 15,000 years ago. On that basis, this is their land through, even though there's not a shred of them left in it, right? It was all before. They came back and claimed it on that basis. So and they, don't you think that's wrong? Yeah, I, I listen, I want to do it, I want to do like you, but I'm also realist. I know that. Uh, I, I think the Israeli ideology of this may have happened 6,000 years ago is nuts. Plus, it didn't happen. A lot of people are suffering for it. There's no question about it. But what are you going to do? Uh, this eye for an eye just makes everyone blind. I mean, that's the problem. Is collectivism is is an endless it's endless violence. It is. Right. You can always trace back and say, well, at this point, this guy who you know who was right-handed did this. So all you right-handed motherfuckers, I'm going to kill you all of you. You know, it is really it's just retarded to say. You know, people of the same skin color or of the same language group, whatever, a portion of them did this to these people. So all of you now I can just murder without regret. I mean, that is uh, not leading to a good future. It will never end because it just starts a cycle of violence. And you can't win until one group just completely annihilates every single other person that is another tribe. Precisely. And it's much better. That's the way it's going. And it's important to point that concept out. It's better to admit the crimes and what has happened and not seek revenge if it was 15,000 or 9,000 years ago and, uh, you know, yeah. prevent what's happening. Like, I don't want to wipe out Israel. I don't want to nuke them. I would like a two-state solution. Um, you can't you can't just blame collectively groups for what these psychos are doing. I mean, there's there's Christian evangelists who are supporting that, and then there's other Christians that are – in opposition to it. There's the Quakers and stuff who are completely nonviolent, never had a war ever. Uh the Mennonites and so forth. And, and they all believe in the same God and all. It's just different like brand of it. It's um it doesn't divide along religious or racial lines. I mean those things those are human constructs. Religions are fairy tales. 
and races, while they are, like, that is real. I'm not one of those people that are like, race isn't real. That race is real, but a lot of racism is a human construct. It's, um, it, if there wasn't the collectivism that attributed, like, well, my race had, like, X number of inventors or whatever, and this race did that, I mean, this is like, well, you didn't do squat, you know? You're just, like, drawing circles around groups and saying, well, somebody that belongs to this category did X, therefore we elevate the entire gal- category, or we de-elevate the entire category. And it's just it's a, a bad way of thinking about things. I know, but the thing is that to talk about it and identify what's going on, the reality of it, what I didn't like always is that, that somehow Caucasian people got blamed for uh, decimating the Indians. Very popular but see, notion. that's the thing. White people didn't kill the Indians. The British and the French and the Spanish nations did it. You look at what were the Polish doing? They're white. Did they kill them? No. What were the? I mean, there's so many other whites that live in other areas that had nothing to do with it at all. It wasn't the whites. It was the evangelical Christian Puritan elements from those countries as an ideology that did it, not as a race. Okay. Yeah. My my point is is that this is a very real thing. And if, uh, but what you're saying is true. People, there are plenty of people that just blame the white man for every crime ever in history, and um, they didn't the white man. Listen, it's the thing specific. is, the Spaniard. Like I did uh, research on the Spaniards decimating the, the the tribes that were in San Francisco, and there's a lot of good reference material in the San Francisco libraries about this. There's like wood cuttings and stuff like that. You can see it, and I, I was like, wow. You know, the thing is, is that. Uh, Popular misconceptions are like categorized and uh, delineated and, and, and exclusive to that. No, the fact is is that the Caucasians did murder and beat in wars and stuff like that. The Indians were the uh, were living here just like they did with the Palestinians and Israelis. Same kind of thing. They had an advantage. They beat them. They had, uh, they had the guns. They had bow and arrows. They had, they won. But the fact is also true is that the Indians were fighting amongst each other and killing each other. They crowned them get in their basket. And also they were, they, I believe, the evidence suggests that there were Caucasian people living here in North America, and when the white men came again, they weren't living there. Okay, what happened to them? We don't know. But I, I contend they were genocided out. You could say that they all intermarried, and we, uh, and that could happen too. But they, it wasn't like the or, Indians were a bunch or, of innocent. They were a bunch of warfare there. people. They were killing each other left and right. It wasn't like hey, they were. I do not people. have. I do not have a romanticized version of, of American Indians and okay. where all people on all parts of the They're earth. They're a bunch of flower to... children before uh, the white man came. They're all just no. running around and making love and jumping the Aztecs, around naked. The Aztecs, no. uh, human sacrifice and murder and so forth. There were some small tribes, same as Europe too, though, uh, who were peaceful. And But that's in any place you can find small groups, like I just said with the Quakers, for example, a modern group who do not go around murdering people and so on. And there were people like in the northern part of Florida and parts of South Carolina and stuff that had never seen an organized war. Never, never. They had personal conflicts, but never would gather up hundreds of people to go murder strangers. But as you go toward west, if you get toward Mexico, if you get toward California, yeah, man, they had slaves, war, and all that. I mean, it. but to me, I don't care if they have war or not. It was wrong for them to war on each other, and it was wrong to war with the Europeans, and it was wrong for the Europeans to war with other Europeans. Oh, what are the British? versus French battle, you know? It doesn't... I don't have this concept of, like, one race doing something to another. What I see is resource wars and stuff, and I say, what's wrong... Oh, you got 90 seconds. No, what's no, wrong it, is for, you know, one group like of people to covet the resources no. of another and use force to take them, uh, regardless of, you know, where they're from or whatever. Well, yeah, that's what's going forward. Uh, we're not streaming live after this, it's, uh, just, but it's still recording. Um, well, uh, are, you've, uh, you've done your research, and you understand uh, that the, uh, about the Zionist connection uh, uh, to 911. Uh, what do you see going forward then? Based, I mean, listen, they're getting away with it. It's water under the bridge in that, in that respect. They're getting their way. Uh, emboldened by that, do you think they're going to continue to have similar operations that yield uh, – you know, preverse or uh, backward, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, straight. Right. What's the ultimate, uh, like, what, 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 this group, well, there's a lot of old people. Are they passing the bit town off to younger groups in their family or something like that so this will continue on? Do we have to worry about this, you know, this continual uh, 
you know, these evil, maniacal, amoral people uh, continuing on and their, and their forebears as well? It will continue, but not for very long. And, the, and I'll tell you why. Maybe you might think I'm an optimist or something, but the major difference between this conspiracy and, say, what happened with JFK and RFK or, or other... Ten seconds, crap. Is no, no, it's okay. It keeps it, recording. We're just not live streaming. That's all. Don't worry about it. Well, we can break the monopoly over the control of media because of the web. And because of the web, I mean, think about how little you know about 9-11 or any of the rest of it if there was no internet. Right. Before, they had a much, much easier time pulling these things off. And now they're going to have to be far more careful. And uh, they're getting busted immediately. I mean, when they did the Saddam statue toppling, within that day, we knew it was rigged and was on the web. It took another five years before it got on television, but we knew immediately. And so that this ability to share information is what's finally bringing it all down because that's where it starts. The media is a meta issue. And that's why we have radio shows like this and websites and so on because that – that is the main weapon we have is this information war. Because the information leads to action. If you don't have the information, you have nothing. It's grassroots. You don't even, you don't even know what to attack. Yeah, it is grassroots. I mean, look at all the films about the Fed. I used to talk about that in like 1996. So I might as well have been talking to the wall. And I thought it would never change. And then suddenly there were movies about it and rallies about it and people talking about it in college campuses. I thought, wow, if I had known that back then, I would have been more passionate about it. But I just thought, oh, I'm just – nobody – I'm just a nerd. Nobody knows what I'm saying. You know, <laughs> they wouldn't even believe it was private. You know, I was at that point. Uh, so the, we still... the traditional media is uh, – it's the, it's in the trash heap of time. It's, it's revealed as well that they were all compromised. They're all uh, taking money from the government to uh, spew a certain line and uh, avoid certain subjects, whereas the, uh, the new – uh, Did you see my video about the media and their board of directors and how it overlaps with the Pentagon? Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh. Excellent. Dude, you should you should see that. Well, talk about some of the other genres or other aspects of you know the deception that you outside of nine one one. What else have you covered? Oh man, for I've been doing it since on my website. Well, okay, since you have a website. Yeah, since two thousand, I started. I had one uh, on AOL. It got erased, um, and actually, it was about Native American issues. It got converted to uh, anti war site because I saw the war with Afghanistan coming. And I was actually a little afraid on 911 to give my opinion that right away because I wanted you know I wanted it to be more solid. But the day it happened, I was like, wow, that's insurance fraud or something. And then when they started blaming Bin Laden, I go, okay, Israelis, you know, like, because uh, I knew about that already. I had already been reading the PNAC papers by coincidence because I was uh, doing this thing in college. I was in college at the time in 2001 for William and Mary, and so I, I thought when I started hearing these lies on TV, I thought, man, I've read that before somewhere, and um, this, they hadn't, you know, put it all online yet. And once they did, it was easy. So I, that's where it was. You know, I had the, the paper documents. I was living in Virginia, so um, yeah, I've covered hmm, all kinds of contemporary events. I mean, mostly about the wars and financial scandals. Um, the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, the all the false flag from uh, Yemen, the underwear bomber was a, a recent false flag. The FBI's attempts to get people to attack mosques and stuff in the United States. I mean, but they're, the thing is, they're failing. There were like four out of five of those fell apart. They go, oh, this FBI, it was entrapment, you know. Um, WikiLeaks, I got all over them. I ousted them from back in April. Um, when, because it was strange that here was this group that was being promoted by Time Magazine and stuff before they had even released anything, and then when they did, it was just like you know a helicopter shooting journalist, whatever. And I was like, man, I've seen hundreds of videos like that, and they didn't go, they didn't get all this attention. Why is this group getting this attention? And I looked into it, and the financiers and people on there were the Sons, were all these anti-China faction groups. And it slowly got kind of morphed, and was it's black market intelligence. You know, they had all these cables they released that didn't really say anything, but they were of a very personal nature, saying you know specifically you know what Hillary Clinton said at a dinner party and stuff like that. That is subtle blackmail, saying, look, we know your most private com- conversations, and even though all we said was a bunch of trivial junk about you know what this guy's opinion was of this leader, and he said something, you know, it's all he said, she said stuff. It's also a way of saying. Guess what else we know? And it, they are selling this intel to the black markets. 
and Cryptomine guy Cryptomine is the ones who busted the Niger forgeries. That's the group that busted that uh Souter was on the FBI's list for nine eleven as a suspect. So that's a solid actual whistleblowers group. So it's Sibel Edmonds and Boiling Frogs. Those are real whistleblower groups. When Sibel you know, Sibel Edmonds, the FBI translator that had, was privy to this information about the ATC uh and APAC selling secrets uh, of nuclear technology and uh, how Grossman had 9-11 suspects shipped out of the country. That That's some very damning information. Where was all the media fanfare for her? She had a gag order placed on her. Where was her cultism like they have for Assange? Nobody stuck up for her. I mean, a few people, Scott Horton, and I mean some, but I mean like mainstream media. They weren't screaming about Sabelle's case. They didn't say anything about cryptomy. But when it came to WikiLeaks, who said nothing but stuff we already knew and avoided Israel like it was the plague, then it got all this attention. That's why I said, okay, this is not a sincere organization. And just the fact that it got so much attention on the press was the first red flag. But that it got prior to even release anything was the second red flag. And then you looked at what they released, and it's all this nonsense that doesn't mean anything, plus propaganda about Iran, saying they you know, had suicide vests and building nukes. and stuff. It's just cables. So they have this distancing factor. say, well, we didn't say that. We just happened to release information that said that to the press who we knew would say it, you know. And they released it, they filtered it and gave it to the New York Times and these other organizations that lied about Iraq, that lied about everything before. And of course, they're pre they've been preaching the uh bomb Iran mantra for years. And this is it's the same as Iraq, but it's not working. It's, you know, how many times can a boy cry Wolfowitz or Wolf sorry, uh or Wolf Blitzer? It doesn't work. Uh, the, the people are not buying it. There are there are some people who who do, but they would believe anything. You could say Ahmed Shinajad's a vampire, and some rednecks would be like, "Yeah, yeah, he's a vampire." You know, like, anything bad because they're just looking for an excuse. It's a vicarious machoism for them. They like that shock and awe. You know, we're gonna go blow them up. You know, they just feel big and bad about it. But um. Truth is, uh, there is no motive for them to build nukes. The IEA has inspected them multiple times, and hasn't found anything. So it's reasonable to conclude that they are building nuclear power, like they said they were, which they need because they get a majority of their electricity from oil, whereas we get ours from coal. Only one percent of electricity is made from oil in the U.S. It's mostly coal and uh, hydro and nuclear and so other sources. <clears throat> so we can use our oil for gasoline. They cannot. If they could get uh, nuclear power and then they could free up all that oil to sell which would drop the price of oil and that's a bad thing for oil companies mm-hmm. well again uh, Israel security I mean before there was no problem but now Israel security means that they can't have uh, a nuclear uh, reactor or something because they could have a byproduct from that could be a nuclear weapon that uh, well could be fired at Israel ending the whole party so so Israel has nuclear bombs that they built in secret in the Moya. But that's the whole – I didn't get into Kennedy, but that was one of the main reasons for that. He was having people inspect it. They even built a phony plant for the Americans to inspect. You know, <laughs> Mordecai Benunu went and busted them, took pictures of it and everything. And it's still sort of an open secret. They deny that they have them. They will not sign in any of the treaties that we have with everyone else, with France and China and India, and everyone else has a bomb. Uh, Israel has a bomb, but they are not subject to inspections. Iran does not have the bomb, and they're repeatedly subject to inspections. And so it's really wrong for us, the country with more nukes than anybody, to be pointing the finger and saying, you're going to get one, when they can point at us and say, well, you have tens of thousands of them, and you've used them before. <laughs> you know, you're the only ones who've used them. It will also be national suicide uh, if they did some. if they actually, at this point in time, if they, uh, even oh, with they all would, the rhetoric, yeah, Israel's a stinking corpse and all this other sort of thing. Uh, they'd be a class I'm, parking lot. I mean, yeah, exactly. Could... It would make no sense. It would be national suicide to use uh, like that. So uh, then it would be plausible de- uh, deniability that you uh, would bring up and say, well, they will give it to Hamas, and then they'll do it, and they'll have plausible deniability. So based on that, uh, we can... but that's getting just extrapolating a little bit too far, I think. Hamas could get it from uh, anywhere. They could steal it. They're terrorists, right? They could just uh, get it uh, as terrorists get stuff. Like they got uh, access Israel to created place. Hamas. They'd say they give it to Hezbollah, but whatever. I mean, you're not going to build a nuclear bomb and give it away. 
that's not happening. <laughs> you know? And uh, there's no reason to nuke Israel. It's not going to fix any other problems. It's just going to bring back nukes on themselves. Um, right. it, there's just no. It's just so a it's crazy a red herring scenario. All the way down the line. Exactly. It's, so the problem is really not the nuclear. It's it's like it's just the same with uh, Iraq. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, you're hiding them, we know it, we're checking, you're hiding them, uh, we're coming in. It's the same thing I read. We know you got it, you're hiding it, we're coming in. And you then, gotta prove a negative. They'll say, right. you got them, and we say, no we don't, prove, prove that we do. And they're like, no, 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 we don't have to prove anything, we just claim you do, and you have to prove that you don't. Yeah, well, how are you supposed to show you don't lying. have something? <laughs> like, well, nobody's seen one. There isn't anything here. What would exactly do you want us to do? And they say, if you don't, if you don't stop, you're uh, producing these things. We're going to bomb you. Like, well, but we're not producing any of them. And they're like, well, if you don't, I mean, they say the same thing with Palestine. They're like, well, until you, until you control everyone firing rockets and da da da. da. And it's like, well, okay, how about maybe, just maybe, possibly the. Occupation is a source of the conflict. I'm just going to throw that out there. You know, murdering kids and stuff that kind of makes people mad. And you know, nope, they that will not acknowledge. They can't. How can you simultaneously occupy people and talk about peace? How do you say we can have peace, but we're going to continue building racial colonies and bulldozing down houses and shooting people? But that's all in defense. Yet when you react to all that, then we're blaming you as the source of it. When the one, it is up to the occupiers to in an occupation, not the occupied. And it's not up to the occupied to prevent the occupation. Obviously, they don't want to be occupied. You know, it's like a, it's like a rapist blaming the victim. She wanted, she, if she hadn't resisted, I wouldn't have had to hit her. <laughs> it's like, exactly. well, if you hadn't been raping her, she wouldn't have been resisting. You know? right. right. And so, yeah, they they want the key. You need it too. We want to come in here and decimate you people, and we want you to go quietly. And it's just same. That's the same mentality with the cops. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we know uh, we're going to do stuff that will strike you as being in violation of your constitutional rights. But never mind. We were going to do it anyways, uh, and you're going to let us. And if you don't, uh, we're going to lie uh, about it, and uh, you're not going to get your way. And uh, so you know how the courts are and how the. It reminds me uh, that story. I'm sure you heard about the cop that shot a nine-year-old girl in Detroit and got put on paid leave. No, our seven-year-old. She was seven. Nine-year-old was in Arizona. So they made a big deal of, but the seven-year-old killed. The seven-year-old black girl gets shot in the neck while she's asleep. They barge into the wrong house to begin with. It's supposed to be in the apartment upstairs. They're trying to play movie commando because this is all on film, you know, which kind of made them act differently. Uh, bust in the door, shoot this girl scared the hell out of the grandmother. And rather than being fired or fined or sued for shooting a seven-year-old unarmed sleeping girl on a couch in the house you weren't even supposed to be into, got put on paid leave. Still getting paid, not even doing work. That's such an insult. So the thing is, if a cop or a soldier murders a little girl, it's that's okay. You get paid to do that. But when a psychopath, an MK Ultra kook, or somebody shoots a little girl, then they are the demon among demons, which they are. But not when a cop does it. When you have a badge, then you're you have authority to shoot little kids. Oh, and emboldens them. I got a great video up here on my uh, channel. Uh, it was a, a, a copy of something that happened in uh, Utah recently, where they uh, cops uh, were serving a search warrant and. Uh, there's a black man in there with a golf club. They never told him. It's like the whole video is like a, a 52 minutes long, from start from kick from door getting kicked down to uh, shooting the guy five times in the chest and, he, and then killing him. And it was like, Jeez. It's right. It's yeah. It's 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 death on tape. It's a straight up. You can't even. It's just as, as cold and straight up as it gets. And it's like faces of death, but real. Uh, mm. he, he was like 10 feet away from him. He somebody just kicked down his door. He didn't hear. This is Utah police. They didn't like. They just said, "This Utah police were coming in cuff." Boom! They kicked the door. And he was like, "Like, yeah, I heard something." And like, but I was watching TV. What the fuck is that? And then so someone kicking down your door. He grabs a golf club. He's ten feet away from him. The cops see the golf club. They feel threatened by it. Our safety was in jeopardy. He had a golf club, so we shoot him dead. We he have bulletproof. Back up. <laughs> we have bulletproof helmets on. There's ten of us. There's one of him. We are in fear of our safety. I like pussies. Why don't you get a job as a florist or something like that? You got, listen, if you're going to do a job, you might get your hands dirty. If 
you're going to be a cop, you might get somebody come back on you. So, yeah, that's just part of the game. No, they want their cake and eat it too. It's a similar mindset. And no, the cops are completely off the. Hook. I bet they got away with it as well. I mean, they did. That's it was a they... scary black guy. So had to shoot him. He had it. Hit. Old, it was an old man too. It was like he wasn't like some young kid or something. It was like this sixty-year-old man with a golf club in his hand. You know. And he didn't come at him. He was just holding it. They didn't say drop it either. That's the main thing. They didn't say drop the club and give him a chance. They saw the club. They shot him dead. It, it all plays out. Uh, it's another example of, yes, I believe that. 100% the cops are completely nuts, and they don't care. They've got themselves so high up the, their own uh, theory of themselves. Well, it's our it's our legal realm as well because we let them get away with it. When that happens, they ought to be put in jail, but they're not. No. Um, it's larger than just the police. It's our whole legal system, and and the fact that like it probably wouldn't have mattered that he was black, but I I think it I think it still matters. I think there's still a lot of bias towards you know if black victims, it, you're a little bit more likely for the cop to get off the hook than it, at least at least the men for sure. If it had been a well, I don't know because that little girl got shot and he got away with it. So yeah, it just seemed like if it had been a uh, I don't know, a teenage white girl, then it would have been different. Even if she'd been holding a knife or something, I don't know, they wouldn't have mattered. By the same token, though, by the same token, it pisses off black people. And so when the blacks become cops and stuff like that, they have a resentment towards white people. That's what I feel because it's something that happened to me mm-hmm. uh, where the shoe yeah. was on the other foot, okay, with cops and everything like that. So that's what I believe. So that, that's why. As white people, you don't want white people, white cops going off on blacks because a turnabout will come about. That's what I was saying. That's my general theory back on the whole thing with this thing is that, you know, you start jetting, uh, citing some people out and you don't finish them off entirely. The germ of them will come back, will feel justified in taking you out and stuff like that somewhere down the, centuries down the road. Similar thing is going to happen with America. Same would happen with Rome. We've been going around causing shit all over the place. People know what's wrong, but there's nothing they can do about it now. But if there's a chance to get back at uh, America and its citizens, whatever they are, two, three hundred years down the line, whatever, they're going to remember these times. That's why it's important uh, to take care of our leadership before somebody else has to take care of us for not doing it. That's a, the that's U.S., a, like Rome, is killing itself from within because the Visigoths and all never would have made it where they did had Rome not imploded their economy and outsourced the mercenaries and da 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 da. The U.S. is going the way of the USSR. We're looking at an economic implosion. The dollar is in free fall. We have so much corporate fraud and financial crime. It, I can't even wrap my mind around what a trillion means, much less ten trillion. It's just beyond my comprehension. The number is so big. And who do you get to prosecute the government or the Fed? You know, who's above them to? tar and feather them like they deserve. No, I mean, it, it is. At some point, uh, we're going to have to break out of the fluoride-induced, uh, you know, uh, uh, fog and <laughs> apathy and actually take it back. I think that's the only way it's going to happen because the, the bureaucrats are so entrenched, the chain of command is so set to receiving any order and following it, right or wrong don't matter anymore. But this is by the bullshit. Hey, we did, uh, we did block the Patriot Act recently, or portions of it. Yay! It's something, to, something yeah. positive. You know? yeah, yeah. It is coming. I mean, I think, and that was the Tea Party guys, uh, who are, who are by no means uh, a solution, but were a step in the right direction just to get rid of incumbents. I don't care if they replaced them with animals that did nothing but sit in a chair and did nothing at all. It'd be better than what we had. But um, I think this, this movement, it's centered a lot around Ron Paul, but you know he he's won't be the next president and then he'll die before, you know he's 70 something he but what he started is going to pass on to someone and i i hope uh it's either going to be that or we're going to have a violent uh physical revolution which uh, I, I see a hard time with that happening too because there's just so much apathy and um even when we do protest it's not covered. It's, it's going to have to be the expansion of the web as it grows now that we have more video sites. Like they took off the 15-minute cap on YouTube and stuff. Little things like that are extremely important because you can get like – you would not have been able to see the documentary I made had that not happened, you know, um, not the full video. We had it in little cuts. And what they did on my other name is they 
omitted the three most important segments of it. Really? Yep. <laughs> wow. And so, uh, and uh, so I watered down, and you'll catch a little parts in there. It says image censored by YouTube, or this. Really? You know, yeah. Right Let me in ask there. you something. In the uncut version of the one, of the other episodes added uh, that you mentioned earlier uh, to Decep- your, uh, Deception Movie. The reason that's on Are DVD they harder core or something? Are they oh, more sensitive or what? Oh, oh yeah, man. That's slamming. Or good that. stuff. It's good stuff. Um, I don't know if it's as good as, you know, finding the elevator operator teams or the vans pack the bombs for the 9-11 stuff. But for the Iraq War stuff, it is hardcore. And for the Israeli stuff, it's more slamming, too. I can't – I don't want to put that online because I know from the past when I did, I got it removed and it, you get stripes, you know. And it, if I throw that up there – I will lose my account and I'll lose all my other videos as well. So I'll just stick it on the DVD, and then someone else will take it. And, and once that goes out, then it'll be in too many places at once, you know, and I'm okay with that. But, but is, there, uh, is there some copyright issues there in it then? Is that the justification for taking it down or striking you? No, they didn't give me any justification. Because they didn't put a copyright saying that some of the no, songs uh, – No, because uh, even if I had that, if I had like a portion of a song or something – you usually get a warning and it just says here it's restricted to these countries or something like that. This is just flat out removed. And it's mostly just me talking. You know? <laughs> like, um, I even had one that was just my camera on because I tried that. I'm like, okay, here we go. No music, me talking in a room to my camera, just saying the facts. And that got taken out. So there's no reason. Usually they use the gore pretext, like if you show a little kid that's been shot or something, because you are doing a film about a war, and you want to show what war actually looks like instead of painting it like a video game, they'll say that's grotesque and then erase all of it, even though it's a war documentary. So uh, so I, I tried just talking to a camera, and they wouldn't even allow that. We have to get something going on my website that uh, can showcase uh, your DVD and uh, and then I uh, offer it uh, like a way of contacting you or uh, redirecting you uh, so they can order it or get it from you or something like that. So I like to try to do uh, do something like that. I, uh, uh, is it a yeah. file? Is it a file though that can uh, be downloaded uh, like you know without having a, you know, a spinning DVD? I can make it into uh, just a a downloadable file. I threw it up on Mega Video. It lasted about a day and a half. How many um, megabytes is it? The whole, the whole thing, probably. Is it huge? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an hour and a half. So what is it like? So, I don't know, um, a gigabyte or something like that? Is it a huge? No, or? it's not a gig. It's it's like 780 megs or something. Shit, really? Uh, okay. But see, I can, I can put it in a Flash file or Windows Media file, and it drops down to about 200. So... It's, can, it's not as big as the uh, as the two hour and twenty five minute one that's up there, but that's you know YouTube converts it to flash and it's dramatically it's reduced in quality too. But it you know it doesn't matter. You're not looking at uh, to see the sweat on someone's forehead. It's just an information film anyway. So right. and do it as a flash file, and then people see could my, play. I, see what the, I have like a file upload thing here. I want to see what the megabyte uh, min, forget what it is. People are like, will you put an AVI version up? I'm like, no. Do you know how big that would be? <laughs> I'd have to be waiting a week for it to upload, and if there's any problems there, it would all get you know canceled. It's they uh, they don't know. You know, they make these little two minute long movies and think, well, I have AVI. I'm like, yeah, you go and try a three hour one and see how that works. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Not with the free stuff that I have. <laughs> We have to do have to do something about uh, trying to uh, make that accessible. So because I have my own website, they're not going to. I don't have to worry about uh, uh, anything like that. Scrutinized. They have no time to see. You know, uh, especially yeah. something like that. They, they're not going to. Well, it's the uh, bandwidth problem. If you get a lot of people watching it at once, it'll just lag. And, and if it's a file, a downloadable file. Oh uh, yeah, they can do that. Right click it and. So maybe have it. like a have a video, like a teaser video, uh, and say, okay, there's the first ten minutes of it, or something, or uh, snippets of it. Uh, and then say, do you want to see the whole movie? And uh, you know, here it is, free. Just upload this file, and they could do it themselves and see the balance of it. So that might be one way of handling it, or something like that. Uh, or then say, hey, would you like this on DVD? Well, then here's the way of uh, getting in contact. Uh, it's like five bucks. I mean, and that's because I have to mail it from Japan. No, it's very giving. I mean, that's a blank disc and a set, and then stamp. Because a dollar is only worth about seventy-nine cents. 
Is that what it's down to? It's eighty yeah. to the dollar now, huh? Uh yeah. It was 120, and then it went to 100 was even, and now it's only about. It was 80, 81 for a long time, and yesterday it was 79. I know because I went and exchanged a hundred dollar bill, and I ended up with uh, not very much. Transaction fee of 21 dollars, and then the depreciation of the dollar I ended up with like 49 dollars. <laughs> Well, the thing is, had I done, you know, ten thousand, it still would have been twenty one. You know. Oh. What's so that? what sucks is I only had a hundred. I'm like, well, I'm still gonna be in the plus range, so I'll go ahead and do it because I need it. <laughs> but yeah, that sucks. Actually, it was two thousand one hundred yen, so it's more like twenty seven bucks or whatever. Yep. And it's not going to change because unless Japan does something drastically retarded, because. Bernanke is still creating more money. You know, the U.S. Mint is the one physically printing it, but they're just printing it to buy the bonds. So as if Bernanke printed it, he's creating it digitally. So, But um, hopefully these meetings, you know, Ron Paul's now on the finance committee, but he can grill them. The thing is, you can watch on C-SPAN. Like you can see Wolf, Wolf, uh, Wolfwitz getting grilled and all, but it doesn't. They sit there, and you know you see Donald Rumsfeld getting schooled by Cynthia McKinney, which was awesome. But it doesn't matter. They're just like, uh huh, uh huh, we lied. But it doesn't. No one watches C-SPAN, you know, just us guys. It's not on the mainstream news, and so it's as if it never happened. And so we'll catch them on the lies and all, but I don't think that will really matter. It's gotta, it's gotta hit um, television, which it never will. So I think the only thing we can do is to increase. Web audiences. I mean, when the when somebody lies to you over and over and over again, don't listen to them anymore. It surprises me the memory. I mean, look at all the campaign promises Obama made <laughs> versus what he's done, which be which should have been clear because of his Senate record. He'd always been a war monitoring brick, but and even George Bush got up and said he wasn't for nation building and he would use the military judiciously and he'd always have an exit strategy and. It was all lies, but it's like they can't remember just a couple of years ago. Um, but what's great about the web is you can take a clip of them when they said it versus what they're doing now and show a, show someone right away, even a living, even an idiot, can understand it then. So the web is absolutely vital. Well, uh, that's the thing. The cat's out of the bag about this stuff. Now we're watching a little bit closer, like you mentioned before. And uh, so they're going to have to really up their game to pass it by the scrutiny of the sharing Internet world uh, and taking the Internet world away. It's it's bad for business, too. So uh, They tried censoring it. Look what happened when Fox bought MySpace. Everyone left. I mean, MySpace was huge, huge yes. information site. It was, still kind of is. But once Fox took it and censored it, you know, they kept they started getting rid of political bloggers. I got axed twice, kept remaking names, got axed. And uh, you know, saturated with ads and they did some other mistakes, but basically everyone left and now they're on Facebook and if they co opt Facebook, same thing will happen. People will leave and another something else in the market will take its place. Because we want free speech and we do not have that. Um once uh, Fox Business took a move for Murdoch, bought MySpace, and it just went into the toilet. Yeah, and, they uh, ruined MySpace. Now, uh, Goldman Sachs is trying to get into uh, Facebook. And they'll ruin people's machinery. <laughs> if they start censoring people like that and all, what they don't understand is yes, it starts with a bunch of narcissists, look at me, you know, teens and whatever, but a lot of people on the share sites, uh, the large bulk of it is political. It's. um. And it's there is a huge 9/11 truth movement, but also a huge anti-war movement and stuff. And this is the only place they can really share information. Um, you can independently find it if you know the sites, but if you're trying to expand it to new people, to your friends and stuff, this is the easiest way. Just post up articles. And, um, there could be a better system, but uh, and I don't like. I mean, there are people on there just playing video games and stuff too. But the thing is, that's the best thing is this mixture. Is you get these political types in there. And then you got all these other people who initially go there to play games or post pictures of, oh, look at my stomach in the mirror or whatever. And then they, so because they're all in the same place, some of their friends, even if one of them is political, they start to bleed into the rest of them. They're like, all right, I'm kind of bored. I'll go ahead and watch uh, this guy Ryan's video about this. And then they're like, holy crap, you know. 
and they become fanatics. It's um, you get people who are not political become political by pushing them in the same social circles, and all of us political people are out there expanding and expanding um, like never before. Like this TSA thing really helped push push the ball because. That was something they, you know, they turned the heat up on the frog a little bit too much, too quick, because that's something that affected people personally that they could see immediately. They could see the direct, concrete effects of it. I go to the airport and get, you know, raped, so they could see that. And people who have never said anything political ever in their life, I mean, once they got molested by the TSA, and then they'd seen, you know, these other guys that always talk about that stuff, and then all of a sudden they're interested. And I actually had people request to me to do a video on the TSA, which I did, and I went and linked it all the way back to the Unaware Bomber and the uh, the Chertoff Group and the government of India and blah, 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 blah. And I never probably could have gotten people to watch that before, some people, but I got non-political people to watch it after the TSA started the naked body scanners and so forth. I mean, we've been talking about that since 2007 at least, but it got a lot of um, momentum once it started being implemented and you follow the money and you see what's going on. So now, once I go from that and saying, guess what else Chertoff did, you know, and just sort of keep going and going. Uh, so these social sites are awesome. But yeah, you uh, want to go where the people are at. And clearly, uh, because Facebook works uh, functional, it's kind of a generic-ass site. I mean, that's the cool thing about MySpace, which you could customize it and everything, you know, do it up. At your yeah, MySpace thing. is actually a better site because of the – one, the blog aspect, so people could subscribe and you could post a blog and they get an email of it and be able to read it right away. I still use mine for that. My particular page is doing great, but, I mean, in general, my space is tanked. But, uh, and Facebook's more generic. But I have people saying, oh, all those sites shouldn't do them, da, da, da. I'm like, no. It's, look, one, I don't care if people have my information because uh, everyone has my information anyway, <laughs> all the stuff I've been doing on radio and so on. So it doesn't matter to me. But this is – I've gotten a lot of people who are on my website came from either MySpace or Facebook or YouTube. So even I know how corrupt all those places are, but um, it's consider it extra. You know? That's a place to reach people. That's where the people are. That's where common people are. So I say go ahead and use them. Use MySpace. Use Facebook. Use YouTube. Use all of them. And when they censor you, then they censor you. you know? Just consider it as extra. Because there's a lot of people you never would get in contact with if you didn't have these mediums. you got to be careful, but I'll let you know this. I mean, uh, like, uh, if you search Bob Chapman, who's very uh, much an outspoken uh, on the Illuminati, he doesn't say Zionist, he says Illuminati. So it, these are some people, they don't yeah. want to say it out straight out, but he's, he's really... Code word. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's on Alex Jones every Friday. Anyways, uh, well, that's why he doesn't say it then. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> because you, because you can't. You got to see my Jonestown video. Oh, that what you call it? I, no, but, but oh should, man, I made him look like he is. <laughs> well, he has a, he has a Jewish lady who's his lawyer, who everything Infowars and all that stuff's in her name. So he's got himself uh, <laughs> and all of his advertisers are Jewish people, and and I hope they're not Zionists. I hope they're not. He Zionists. got up and said, he got up and said he stood with Israel, and he could, he supported. The wall that he also thought was on their border, and it's not. It goes across the green line. He said ridiculous stuff about Israel. He won't even admit that there is an occupation. I mean, that's you know, occupation 101. He won't even acknowledge the occupation. So his viewers, unless they got it from somewhere else, aren't even aware that Palestine is being colonized. So he just doesn't know anything about Israel because he's a holy roller Christian himself. He is like big time religious, you know. And uh, I don't care about his lawyer and his wife and all that. I mean, he will not <laughs> talk about. Oh, that that got. I, I mentioned that. I just happened to bring that up. Oh, that was they got on me at, on his forum. I went over there to Infowars. Well, uh, you know, but see, oh. those are those are poor arguments anyway. And like, I don't care about any of that. The fact is, for whatever reason, he won't talk about the elephant in the room. I mean, he talks on and on about nine eleven. I'm like, look, how is it possible? Banksters, you know, that's his way of of, of banksters. Well. It's Banker. sort of true. I mean, <laughs> but but I mean, come on. There's an intelligence group from a foreign country caught with vans packed with bombs. That's the end. <laughs> end of story right there. You, they did it. You know, the same group um, had the front companies that were in the building working on the elevators that were broken for a month. Come on, you know, he's talking about nanothermite and all this crap, and it's like, 
Oh, to find something on a nano, you know what thermite is? Is just aluminum and iron oxide or r- common rust. You know, finding that on a nano level is meaningless. It's like a oh, daw. It's two most common metals there. So who cares? Um, but I think uh, finding people with bombs in a van, yeah, that's uh, pretty hard to just brush away. <laughs> You're supposed to believe that on any particular day. There's Israeli guys running around the streets of New York City uh, with vehicles packed with explosives. Is that a, that commonplace then, or just what happens? Filming the event. Too. I mean, not just Israelis. Israeli spies that work for the Mossad. Yeah, no, you gotta they, add that. They're part. driving around in rented vehicles. Rented? They don't even own them. They rent, they're constantly renting vehicles, packing them with explosives, and cruising around the city. <laughs> it wasn't even an actual <laughs> moving company. These were vehicles purchased. With loans from the U.S. government. <laughs> well, of course, you know. <laughs> yep. I mean, you're transferring the gold and all that. I mean, but, you know, he just, he's like, who they couldn't have anything to do with it? I'm like, really? Because who again lied about the anthrax and said that Al Qaeda got anthrax from Iraqis? Because that was, came from Israeli security. It didn't come, it wasn't a war about oil. That didn't come from Chevron or ExxonMobil or, or BP or anything like that. It came from the OSP. It came from Israeli security sources. It came from these PNAC authors. And when he does talk about PNAC, you know who he talks about? Cheney and Rumsfeld and others. Yeah, he blames the Caucasians. The two, the two of, guys that's a class. That, that aren't directly tied to Israel, the only ones you mentioned. And yeah. they didn't write any of the papers. They just signed the papers. They didn't author any of them. And those two guys are terrible. Don't get me wrong. And Rumsfeld is also involved with the aspartame and the rest of it. And Cheney. They're front men, essentially. They're just like J.P. Morgan. J. P. No, no, Cheney's not a front. front. Cheney is Cheney's a bastard. But um. But they're front men, though. Listen, they are, they wouldn't be in their position based on their own merits. They are there because they are, are look like compromised individuals. Oh yeah, you know who brought both of them in was Ford. President Ford is the one who brought in Cheney and Rumsfeld. And he was on the commission. He was on the Warren Yeah, he was on the Warren Commission. It is like a big circle. I mean, yep. goes back, like I said, an hour ago or whatever about LBJ and my quick history of Egypt. I have a timeline of that, about, by the way, written in kind of like 200 links or so. Um, that's my What's next your film. Website? Excuse me. What is, do you have a website, yes or no? <laughs> yep. Same as my Skype, rise to sense.com. Okay, let me check this out. R Y S. The number two, yeah. And sense as in common sense, like S E N S. Okay, I got you here. All right, let me bookmark this. And uh, When I made that, I know that's a terrible domain name, but I just it used to be called Rise Rants, the one that got deleted, and I had no idea it was going to get so big. I thought, I'll just put this because it doesn't matter. If someone links to it, it'll be in a link, and no one's going to actually have to say it anyway. Because I had no idea I'd be on national radio and doing films and all when I picked it. So, oops. <laughs> I used to have antineocons.com, but somebody, some jerk, got it the day mine ran out. They went in and scooped it up. Well, what was your old your old site for? Antineocons.com. Uh, oh, that, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. But still, if you put antineocons in Google, it'll go to rise two cents. So. I'm okay. Oh really? Yep. And we made sure of that because I stuck it in in black on a black background on the forum. Oh, dude, you have some good traffic numbers here, dude. I just checked out your site, man. Fuck, you got a a, a five hundred thousand Alexa uh, this month, and you even had a little bit four fifty last month. So you got a lot of traffic coming to your site. Oh, I got way more than that. It's just they're going to rise two cents slash anti neocon forum. It's um uh about two million or so a month. Two million what? Um, hits. So I'd have about, I don't know, unique visitors is like 1,400 a day or 1,500 a day or something. Jeez, that's really great, man. Congratulations. That's a very good site. Telling the truth matters. <laughs> I see you got a little AdSense here down here. Uh, uh, does the AdSense seem to work out for you? Are you, are you making a, a couple of pennies on that or what? Yeah, I've gotten about 300 bucks from it over the years. The thing is, uh, the first month I had it, I got $100 immediately. And then for like a year and a half, I didn't get any. I'm like, what's going on? And I found out the guy that helped me put it up had switched it in for his own numbers. 
Ooh. He himself with my traffic. Yeah, what a oh, bastard. That's cold. It is cold. And so I, I said, you can do that for one month and pay yourself 100 bucks. Oh. Help me with some. some no, you have to go in there and physically remove them and put your. Oh, your I did. I got there. him. I got some other nerd. I call them my nerds. It's a good term, though. It's not a negative. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got some. I got a team of nerds now. One of them works for some whatever technical better to flux capacitor or something in Australia, and uh, he switched it back. And that was just a month ago, and I got another hundred already. So it, it seems like I get about a check a month now. Hopefully, um, we'll see. Maybe it takes about a month and a half or two to get enough impressions. Because you can have twenty thousand impressions on your AdSense, and it doesn't. You're still only getting like three cents. So well, you got to have them in the right locations and have the structure right, man. Yeah, uh, well, people got to like... click on it too. <clears throat> I ain't telling you to click on it. I'm just saying, you know, if. <laughs> Can I give you a little constructive criticism? Please don't take it the wrong way. Oh, go ahead, man. I don't know what I'm doing with AdSense. I just threw it on there just for extra. All right, all right here's what you want to do. Number one, your AdSense, like the main one here, is in the left corner at the very bottom, and it's uh, it's a it's a, a square. Uh, that is what you want. What you want to do is you want to get one of the banners, which is the narrow ones. Uh, they're 728 by 180s or whatever they are. That is, and put it underneath the navigation. Okay, oh, throw it up on the top. Mm. Yeah. The all right, best, I'll work on that best. today because rarely do people go all the way to the bottom. I'll tell you how people use my forum. Is on the top where it says current events. That is where everything goes. And then after you, you know, five, six days or whatever, my mods or myself will move that to whatever you know category it fits in. So if it's about a rock, it'll go to a rock. If it's about economics, it'll go there. But Rather than searching through the forum, all you got to do is click on current events, and all every topic is in there. And then it's just sort of understood thing from the members that, yeah, it, if it looks like it disappeared, it didn't. It just got moved to the section that it was about. All right, so. again, so putting it under the navigation, so if they make a mistake, they, click, they accidentally uh, open up a new window or uh, go to that, uh, you know, advertisement, uh, and putting it uh, in locations that uh, are near the top of the navigation, too. Not, there's, like, below the navigation. Uh, that's, like, where your little uh, different buttons that you want to push, like the forum, this, that, and the other thing. Within right the, underneath the flag there in the top corner, maybe. Don't, no, put it where they would normally go uh, to manipulate, uh, to navigate within the site. That's, that's the All right, best right place below the Google it. bar there. spot. And then other places. That Google bar is an ad, too. Huh? That Google bar is a different kind of thing they came out with a couple months ago. Search Google search ads or whatever. Uh, I tried that too. No, that doesn't work for you, man. That very It doesn't me, get nothing, too much. It doesn't nothing really comes off of that either. You'd figure it would. Now but people don't want to really search uh and, and click on something. The best thing is the one at the very in the the top in the center, underneath the navigation and stuff, that's my opinion. Uh I I my sites Try I don't it, have any sites that are a half million Alexa. I've been averaging like ten to fifteen dollars per day. And everything like that, which is really good. Uh, I'm happy with it. I'm stoked with that. That's real good, man. And I don't, I don't have that. If I had a 500, I get like site, I get I'm like five cents a day, dude. <laughs> I get like I might get like a dollar sixteen, even though I'm getting all this traffic. So uh, dude, I'm gonna do under, that. Underperform. Maybe... I hate to say it, but it's just uh, it's cold water on that, dude. If you get your uh, placements right, what you got now is absolutely the wrong thing. I must say, the left corner, a rectangle on the bottom, that is so easily avoided. It's not even funny. It's kind of you kind of be kind of be, you got to kind of be kind of a dick about putting it where they make a mistake, uh, like you know, mousing over something and they hit it accidentally. And, I understand. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's basically that. And also, a lot of times people will leave the site on an ad, so they're like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And they'll just say, oh, that's kind of a cool one over there, and they click on it. And make sure that it's not text only. Right. Text or sometimes I got both. Help, you know, a video type thing or a moving thing will, uh, so it catches their attention. It makes the site look livelier. They're, mo they're more often like leave on one of those. They or something like that, they'll leave uh, your site on that. Is that so, on? Uh, yeah, that's All right. Thing. Well, I got a roll, man. It's – um. Got to work today and do some other things, but appreciate the interview. And we have a recording of that up somewhere. Or? Yeah, it'll be on the site probably in like five or ten minutes on the GoNot page. It should be up there in the player. Yep, it's also on my website automatically. And uh, uh, okay, so check it out. Yeah, I'm interested to see. Hopefully, well, I'll send people work. over then, and um, I'll, uh, we're gonna go play in the snow with my son. So. 
Uh, what I'm <laughs> also going to try to do is get my, one of my YouTube affiliates uh, to try to copy this to YouTube. So uh, about the first five minutes. <laughs> I'll tell them about that part of it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Let me know. Just text me on Skype where that goes, and I can throw a copy of it up on my page if you want, because it'll get a, it'll get a lot of. Trust me, it'll get a lot of traffic. That would be rad, dude. Appreciate it totally. I can send you uh, the player. Actually, uh, I think I can send you the code, little HTML code. Can you put? A, can you incorporate a little piece of HTML code into the website? Your website? Yeah. It turns yeah, into a that. little player, so all I have to do is hit a button there, and it like you know it looks like it's a little cool little format or something. That's one idea. Uh, right on, dude. Well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate talking with you. You're a great searcher in detail. That's exactly what I like to do for my show and everything like that. So uh, thank you very much, Ryan. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Talk to you. Okay, so that was Going Off Radios talking with Ryan of uh, rise 2 com, And 